five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back to the Balance Pressure Covered Podcast. We have a very special guest here today. We've got the Keeper's Nightmare. We've got <laughs> the African Sensation. We've got the Christ Killer. we got Nick. Who's who this bat motherfucker is? Go ahead. All right, we got, we got Etu Tabe on today's show. Uh, the little background that I got from him and is he was born in Cameroon. Uh, he moved here. Did you move here when you were a teenager or like preteen? Yeah, yeah, preteen. Preteen. So yeah. he uh, spent uh, some of his youth, his older youth in the United States in Georgia. Uh, he ended up at Bruton Parker College. That's where we met. Uh, he did a season at Georgia Southwestern. And then um, I believe he played in some leagues in Atlanta for a, a brief period of time, and they made his way to Europe. He uh, did the American Dream, professional soccer in Europe, in Sweden, and in Finland. I'm going to let him pronounce the names because I will butcher them <laughs> so bad. <laughs> so we're going to let him tell you about his uh, the names of those clubs, and then we're going to start asking him some questions. So if, if you don't mind, Etchu, can you tell us the names of the professional clubs you played at? Okay, the first one I played at was in, uh, in Sweden. It was called uh, Jungschiller. And then that was like 45 kilometers away from like uh, Gothenburg. And then the second one was in Finland. It's called uh, Rops. And in a city called uh, Rovaniemi, where that's where Santa Claus lives. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then the, the, other, the other next team I played in was called Coops. It's in Talcom called uh, Kopio. That's the team uh, Freddy Adu came to when he came to Finland. And then uh, the other team I played, it called Haka, in the town called Vakiakoski. And then the last team I played for was in uh, was AF. I was in a small, the Swedish-speaking town called in Kamisari. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Uh, what age did you start playing soccer? Obviously, you were in Cameroon. <laughs> how um, how mad? How crazy? How enthusiastic is the country of Cameroon for? For football bro like football in Cameroon is like it's everything like I grew up literally living next to a football stadium and everybody around the neighborhood played football some of the best players in the in the city in Boya where I grew up they were like very good football players my dad used to play professional my uncles played so it was like everything around me was football football so you could hear games from the stadiums from where I lived so everybody grew up football, playing football. It's like, it's like almost waking up and eating like breakfast in the morning. That's how football was in Cameroon. So I just grew up playing. the sport. Exactly. That was, that was, that was, that was a thing that everybody kind of did. So even now, if you meet any, anybody from Cameroon, they'll tell you they, play, they can play football, even though they can't play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, because it's so like, it's so inbred in, in us, you know. But yeah, so I, I started playing like, my earliest memory was like, I was like five, maybe four, like if I remember, like just listening and hearing football. And then like when Cameroon beat uh, Argentina 1-0. And that's Ooh. when I was out. Yeah, yeah, I was like four, I'm about four years old at the time. And that was like my earliest memory of the, like just sounds of football, like cities, horns of cars going crazy. I mean, you're like, like you won the World Cup. Yeah, wait, yo, that was like the Maradona Argentina, bro. Like that yep. was like, Maradona at his peak. So, so that was like, that was, that was the time when I was growing up, when like football was peaking in Cameroon, you know? So everybody just played. But I played as a kid and played in like, like local competition with kids and stuff, but never anything like, never anything serious. Uh, my parents or my mom was more like into like pushing me towards school, but I always found a way to play around the neighborhoods, just like in any other like neighborhoods around the world where like just, you know, you, you leave go play with your friends, come back, you know, get your ass whooping for your mom because you stayed out too late. So, but yeah, but that was, that was about it, man, uh, until I moved to the U.S. and then played for like high school and then college. So when you were, when you were growing up, I, I, I can imagine there's a couple uh, Cameroon national players that you looked up to, but who did you look up to when you were a kid? Bro, when I was a kid, like my favorite players was like, everybody loved like Roger Miller, you know, the striker, like, he was like one of the oldest strikers to ever play in the World Cup. So like everybody, he was like, actually till this day when I moved to Sweden, that's the one of the players that everybody in Sweden remembers. 
So Beroy Jermila, he was like everybody in Cameroon's idol growing up. And then uh, I started following like uh, Portuguese league or Portuguese football for some reason. I don't know why. And then Luis Figo became one of my favorite players. And then, of course, Samuel Eto as well. But at that time, he was like, when I was growing up, he wasn't like anywhere in the scene. But Roger Mila was like, every kid growing up in the 90s was like, Roger Mila was like, you know, one of the top players. Yeah. So Roger Mila was my home, like, one of my, my first, like, favorite player I can remember. All right. Go ahead, Pedro. So... Playing in high school, like, was it easy for you to, like, ad uh, ad adopt the style, the coaching? Was your school, like, very mixed? Or was there, like, more uh, foreigners or more African-Americans or more, like, a little bit of everything? Who were your coaches from? Like, well, how was the competition? I think my, my school, my high school team, they were much better at, like, baseball and basketball and American football, just like most teams in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, we had we had an okay team. I think it was kind of mixed. Like we had a few like Mexican guys on the team, but mostly Americans, maybe one or two African American guys, and I was like the only African guy on the team. How I'm many years five. did you play um, with the high school team? Oh, four years. I played like no, no, no. I played only one year because I was oh, more wow. like yeah, yeah. I played only one year like high school, and my gotcha. dad was like pushing. Was that in Georgia? Guys. Yeah, it was in uh, Milledgeville, Georgia. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, yeah, gotcha. Baldwin High School. So yeah, my dad was. Well, what's your um? What was your coach from? Uh, he was from he was from Georgia as well. He was American. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. And, and like, I, did he? Because like, you're a very creative player. Like you have like yeah. you know an amazing touch. Like, thanks, bro. Uh, thanks, bro. I try. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> did the uh, did he give you a lot of freedom as far as like um creatively or like was he like? Yeah, was, man. Like, not that open minded. No, that's actually one of the, the fantastic things about my coaches in high school. They was like, just, just let me do, like, do my thing, man. So there was no restrictions. It was like, yeah, go ahead and play. And that's what I did. I mean, that's pretty much how I always played, like almost like freestyle in a way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but that was, that was a lot of fun for sure. So they'd always give me the freedom to just go ahead and play and then whatever we needed to do to win, man. So, so yeah. after high school, what's your next jump as far as uh, Atlanta? Because you play clubs and leagues too, right? Yeah, well, I didn't play in a, I didn't play any uh, clubs and leagues in Atlanta. I actually went to several tryouts and I didn't make it, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> I went to like several actually. I remember my coach, one of my coaches in Rec League in in Milledgeville. Uh, he's almost like a second, like he was almost like family to me. Uh, his name is Stefan Badisbain, and he used to like push you. He used to always tell me, "Yeah, you're gonna make it." He took me to to like tryouts in Atlanta, man. Like I killed, I did great. There's times where I scored like four or five goals in like in like three games, and still like nothing, man. So I went like several. There's there's one time where I went, I played really bad, and then the other times I went, I did very well. But now, man, they were they were not taking me at all. But I was like, yeah, yeah, it was crazy, bro. I I think I've I've failed more tryouts than I've made, like seriously. <laughs> so, but after that, I had to, like my coach, you see what, this guy from Rec, he was always pushing me. He's like, you know what? I know you can make it in Europe all the time. My parents were just like, yo, do your school thing. So, but it, it was cool. And then um, I applied to um, actually several D1 school in Georgia, in, um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, rejected every single time. Hey. <laughs> yeah, man, I got rejected to every single like D1 school I sent well, application to. Well, was it your grades or what? No, no, I had really amazing grades. Uh -huh. No, no, I mean on the football side, like to get a scholarship. That's that's oh, crazy. Yeah, I had really good grades. So it was more scholarship. They were like, yeah, sorry, because my high school was was not that good, man. Like my high school was. We're yeah, they do seem to, to no. take that into consideration too. Yeah, so they, they, they only look at like the school, even though I like I had to set all the records at my high school for like goals and school and assist and everything. They didn't look at that, you know. So just like, yeah, what high school did you come from? I mean, we, uh, my high school was more known for football, American football and like baseball. So no D1 coaches, no D1 coaches were looking at me, bro. So, so that would explain how you ended up at Bruton Parker then. Man. Yeah, it's like I sent a lot. So that was uh, Coach Moore was the only one who sent me like he sent me an um, he sent he was the only one who kind of replied me back or at least the first one. Some other schools replied later, but I didn't like 
I didn't really think about it because once I got a uh, reply back from Coach Moore, I was like, that was it. Because me, I'm like, you know, if I see someone reach out to me and they're, they're willing to like, you know, hey, we want you here and what's more, I'm like, okay, I'm going there. I didn't care who else was going to send me anything. So that's how I got to Boone Parker, man. Man, that's gotcha. crazy, man, because this is kind of a, and I keep saying this, it's a theme and it's, a, it's showing you an inadequacy in the United States Soccer's uh, foundation and how they identify talent because the fact that you played high school at somewhere they've never heard of, they wouldn't even bother with you. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would least, I would at least think at the very least if you were getting in contact with the coaches, they would have invited you up there to watch you or some kind of uh, yeah, they could see with their own eyes, like, is this guy for real or not? Um, yeah, exactly. But, but based on them just saying, like, oh, he played for what high school? Oh, we're not going to take you. That's just – I mean, that's just a small example of what the problem is here in the U.S. Yeah. But, and yeah, you, man, th there's a lot of guys, a lot of talented guys that I play with, bro, but they couldn't go anywhere just because of, like, you know, they were not – we're just the school we came from. Oh, yeah, that's part of your persistence yeah. too, because like you yeah, could have been weeded out like them too. Yeah, yeah, I could have. That could have like broke me, man. But like, again, I knew what I could do, and I had that. My coach from Rec, he was extra supportive, man. Like he was like, yo, he was. He's actually Bulgarian, so and so he kind of knew like what football was for real, you know. And and so he he was always like pushing and always like you know yo no worries you'd be fine you know they don't know what they're talking about so he was one of the people that always like pushed and motivated me to like yo just keep doing what you're doing everything will be all right. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So your first year at Broom Parker, yeah. Like what was that change like for you? Um, you know. Uh, it was it was good actually because I think the training was. For me in high school, like I don't think I when I was in high when I was in high school, I spent more time with like my school stuff than actually training to be a professional. So I think when I got to 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 Bruton Parker, then it was like everyday training. It was more almost like a like a like a professional setting in a way. But I've always just been a guy who just played games. Like I was just good at playing games. And I didn't train like, you know, like 95 like other aspects of the game like like fitness getting the muscles right and all that stuff so when i went to brun parker it was fun but like that's when the injury started bro so oh, it was real? yeah yeah i got a few like hamstring injuries i don't know if you guys remember i had a few few ham few hamstring injuries and then but when i was healing that kind of led me to switch positions then because i didn't need to run as fast as i you know with a half have a, with a, on, an injury that wasn't healed properly. So I didn't need to run as fast. I, that's how I, that's how I kind of switched to like defender instead of a striker, instead of staying as a striker. That was how it started in a way. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So playing um, a Bruton Parker, mm. uh, how, do you, how do you figure out uh, like, um, your training schedule as far as because like I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question later like um yeah how do you figure out like for you personally you know like like your training schedule and your training habits compared to your other teammates because I remember like we used to bust our ass in the gym and like you just walk in there and like lift heavy ass weights like it was not so like you do have a biotype to you yeah yeah I, like I used to I used to like I could lift if I like you know but I didn't have a, a proper structure of how to lift you know how to live with the different types of muscles, you know? I could, because I had a, I was physically, I could say like- I'm Naturally strong. Naturally strong, you know? So I could lift, I could lift weights, but like lifting the right weights or doing the right exercises, you know, that was more the problem. And sometimes I think I did too much because I was trying to come back from injury too fast. And then that ended up hurting me in the long run. So, but I think like the training was like, it was okay. Just like, I didn't know how to train my body. You know, that was, that was one of the problems for me on the, on the training, training aspect, like in the gym. That, yeah. How many seasons do you get to stay in Abram Parker in total? I think it was like two seasons. And I only, and then I was injured for one season quite a lot, I remember. And then once, the other season I played as a central defender and I kept getting like, 
I kept the hamstring injuries kept coming back on and off. And then after that, I just like, okay, I didn't play for like the last year at Boone Park, I didn't play at all. Because it was just like too many injuries. I'm just focusing on school stuff. And then I got an opportunity to transfer. So, so yeah, like, how was, does your opportunity to transfer come along? Do you seek it or do they seek you? No, I think. You know somebody? I, I, I can't, I can try to remember how that happened. But I think someone, uh, somebody knew somebody from uh, Georgia Southwestern State. It was, was kind of fast. Because like, yeah, yeah. like, you were, you were meant to play another season at Broome Park. And then like, yeah. it was like in the middle of summer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm trying to think how that happened. But I can't remember. I think it was two, two, um, two, one, of our, one, of our, one of our teammates had gone there. I don't remember who it was. it was. Or a friend of mine had gone there. It was probably Balak. Then, yeah. <laughs> and then they were, like, they were like, hey, like, you know, we're starting this new program here. You know, would you want to, you know, transfer here? And the scholarship is much better than I was at Boone Parker. So I was like, yeah, sure. Let me go give it a try. And then the coach also said, We'll put you to play a striker again, which was, you know, the normal position. So that was one of the things as well that kind of like convinced me to go. So, yeah. Cool. So you are right there in the fall. Were you a hundred percent? Yeah, I was a hundred percent, man, because I'd like, I'd healed up. I'd been a while without playing, like, you know, playing and I'd, I'd healed up. My, the body was good. And then I think that was the best, pretty much my best season I had in college ever when it comes to like, you know, stats and games played and number of games played and my physical like, you know, upkeep. I think that was one of the best seasons I had. And I played as a striker, striker that season. So it was, it was really good. And the, your teammates, what was your team like? Was uh, was it like very international like Moon Parker or was it more local? Uh, yeah, it was, it was actually very international. We had some like, we had some African guys in the team and then we had maybe one or two like Mexican guys in the team and then a few American guys as well. But it was, it was very, like, it was very mixed. It was a mixed team. And all of the guys were, it was a, the first year, the NAIA was the first year that the school actually had a team. So that was quite, for all of us, it was a new experience. And with a new coach, with a new uh, uh, soccer, soccer team. So oh, what was the first year team? It, we did horrible, man. But we had a lot of fun. And uh -huh. I really liked the guys. But I think we, our record, if I remember correctly, was like, we won like four games. I think that year wow. out of like out of like eighteen or something like that. Something like that, I don't remember, but we won like four four games, I think. Man. But I had I know man, they were it was the first year in the but we had a fantastic Hey, and, like, and there are there are schools that do a lot worse than that too, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Pino. Yeah, We're gonna yeah. say no names, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was it was our first year, you know, so it was it was really it was really like but the guys were friendly. We had some really great players. And then we had like a, a group of guys who just got scholarships. But it was fun. It was a fun group. I like the guys. Yeah. Do you ended up playing two full seasons then or not? No, I played. I played one season. One, one season That's then. Right. And then I, yeah. And then I switched, I switched my, my major. Mm -hmm. And then while I switched my major, I used to go to like Atlanta with uh, just to kind the of play. Silverbacks. No, no, not the Silverbacks. I, again, I went for another try for two tryouts didn't make it again <laughs> so, <laughs> so well, i went to two tryouts uh, while i was in uh at georgia southwestern state and i didn't make it and then jonathan jono he was you he used to always call me up he's like hey we're doing this uh, summer league uh in atlanta where it's like this uh different uh caribbean teams african teams or just anybody can make a team and they play these tournaments in atlanta so that's how i started going to atlanta and playing those leagues and that's where I got seen and then before uh, moving over to Europe so so like it's a random game was like do you get scouted by somebody or yeah actually the, we had we had two games that day so I played uh but our games were like warm-up for an actual like uh they were they were having this event for like uh former J Jamaican international players and they were playing, like, I think some uh, all-star team from Atlanta. So, but the game before that was our game. So it was like a warm-up game to, like, the real, like, event. So, and I didn't want to play because I had another game that evening with another team I was playing. So I, just, I was just playing, like, every, every, all over the place. So, so we played that game, and the, the, there was an agent there who came to, because one of her former players was playing in the all-star game. So they came early and they saw me playing in the first game 
And then that's how they were like, hey, are you playing anywhere? I was like, no. Are you playing for university? No. Do you play for any team? I was like, no. Just, just playing summer league in, in Atlanta with my friends. And they were like, oh, okay. She gave me a card. And then she was like, hey, contact me. I'm, I'm leaving to, uh, to Sweden in like two months. Uh, if you're interested, let me know. And that's how it happened. Just randomly like that. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Educate us in the process. You, you pick up that card. You know, what, yeah. what's that conversation like? Well, like, at first I was like, this is kind of strange. And then You're skeptical. I to, yeah, I wasn't skeptical. I was just like, I wasn't sure what to make of it. But then uh, I talked to some of the guys uh, on the team that I was playing on. And I was like, oh, yeah, that, that it's actually, uh, they were like, this, uh, she's actually a, a lawyer. And but she was an agent at the time, and she was working with some of the Jamaican uh, national team players and all the Jamaican leagues and the team, Trinidad leagues. So I asked some of the guys about her, and they were like, yeah, she's a legit agent. And uh, I was like, okay. Uh, first thing I got to do is convince my dad that, hey, I got an opportunity to go play overseas. And uh, so I took the card, went home, talked to my dad. He's like, no, you have to finish your school. And uh, I was like, no, but I have this really great opportunity. I'd really like to go. And he was like, yeah, if you finish your school, like if you like, you know, do all your exams, finish, and then you can leave. And so I started like just trying to put, do all my like exams ahead of time. And then I called the agent and I was like, okay, um, uh, this was maybe a month after, after it was in August, the tournament, August or July. And then after a month after I called, I said, hey, yeah, I'm, are you still going to Sweden? I'd really like to go. And she was like, okay, have you been training? And then I've, I hadn't been like training, like training. And I was like, yeah, 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 of course I've been training. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then she was like, okay, you have to be fit because we'll be, we'll be leaving in like, in like three weeks. So you have to stay like, you know, make sure you're fit and ready to go. And I was like, oh, Jesus, this is going to suck. So I went back and every day for like two hours in the morning, I'm on the treadmill. Three hours in the night, I'm on the treadmill. Just taking the ball, playing around. So I was just trying to get my fitness up because mm -hmm. I know with the ball, like I'm good. But like, right. I just want to get my fitness up because I know that was pretty much one of the main things. And so uh, I convinced my parents and they were like, okay, we'll let you go. And, but even if you make it, you still come back. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to school. Sure, sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so then we, the three weeks come, comes by and then we take a flight and we go to Sweden. So I arrived in Sweden in like, I think it was like, uh, was it November? And it is cold, like crazy, bro. Like it is just unbelievably cold. I'm like, I'm like lived in Georgia and Cameroon where like there's barely any winter. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I have to be here for like a week and try out and play in this. Like, they, of course they have this artificial turf, but then they, they push the snow out. And then I have to wear like double socks and my shoe, like gloves, double pants. I was like, this is, this is not going to be fun. The first, first game we play, I, I score one goal and I, I make an assist. And then uh, this was like, this was after like maybe one or two days of training. But the, the two days of training wasn't like really anything hard or physical because they're just trying to prepare for the games. And they're just trying to prepare for trial. So it wasn't that hard of the training. And so the first game, like I said, I scored like one goal and I have, I have an assist. And then we had another game like uh, three or four days later. And uh, the next game as well, I scored one goal. And then I think I had two assists in that one. And then immediately after that, this was like one week into my tryouts. So I was going to be there for like two weeks. And the coach already, my agent told me, hey, they want you. I was like, oh, okay, this is fantastic. And then in my head, I'm thinking, <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking, I've been like, I've gone to almost like seven or eight tryouts in Atlanta and I haven't made a single one. <laughs> and I'm being here like one week and two games and already the coach is interested. And it was actually a British coach and he actually used to play for Manchester United like a while ago. So he liked like, I could see the shirt on. Yeah, yeah. So I could see, so but he liked like the first, the fast, that like the physical aspect that I, I had and then my speed and then how um, I control the ball as well. So that's how that happened. So I got an offer from Sweden. And then uh, while I was in Sweden, my agent was like, hey, uh, somebody was like kind of watching you playing and they want you to go to uh, Holland like for a tryout with Sparta Rotterdam. I was like, what? I was, like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, let's go. 
And then we left uh, like two days later and she told the, we told the team in, in uh, the, this young Sheila that, hey, okay, uh, we're going to think about it and then we're going to let them know. So two days after, we fly to, to Holland to spot Rotterdam. And then the first, the first day there, I met some really nice guys and, and then uh, I was there, the first day we didn't train. I just met, like they took me to the stadium, stadium like introduced me to a few people and the stadium looked fantastic. I was like, I can't wait. Like, I hope I can play here. And the next day we have a fitness test, bro. Like, oh my God. That's when I knew that this like professional football is on another level. Like we had to run, like there was this huge like park and we had to do, I think like four or five laps around it on like a pretty like 60%, 70% speed. And it was, it was outrageous, bro. These guys were just like, I was, I was like just barely lapping. Like, Bro, I was barely hanging on. Like, in my head, I'm like, yo, don't let these guys, like, lap you. Don't let them lap. I was like, don't let them lap you. That was all I was trying to say. <laughs> that was all I was trying to say, man. That was all I was thinking. Don't let them lap you. But, like, a few guys were well, like, how, how, how long was it, though? Like, how, how big was that part, like, miles-wise? Yeah. I, probably, like, it's probably, like, four, well, four, about four or five about i don't remember but it was a really big park man Dang. and these guys were yeah but to go like a full full circle it takes like maybe about 10 minutes about 10 minutes to go full circles and okay. these guys were like they were just like running this stuff like the stuff that they do for breakfast like every day yeah and i was yeah. like dying i couldn't breathe and it was quite cold as well and then i was like and then after that day i was like Phew. Thank God I survived that. And then the coach, were, the coach came and talked to me. He was like, yeah, I've have you, have you been training. And I was like, yeah, I've been training in the U.S., but I'm not used to the weather. And I told him straight up, like, like you know, all I need is some time to get used to, like, you know, how everything goes, and I'll, I'll be good. And then we had a game the next day, and all I was just waiting for the game. Like, I was, like, sitting there, like, I can't wait for this game because I knew how bad I did in the fitness test. The talent so, had to make up for the... ex Exactly. So in my head, I'm like, I can't wait. And the next, we play one game. I had a hat trick in that game. Mm -hmm. And then right away, yeah. the yeah, the, the manager was like, like, this was maybe after being there for like two, three days. The manager was like, okay, we, well, what can we do to, to keep him here? And my agent already had a player there. And so it, it turned out that my agent, the player my agent had there, they were having some kind of contract disputes. And so the manager was saying, if they don't sort out this dispute with the player that was there, they wouldn't take any other player from the agent that the agent is bringing. But the coach really wanted me. And then I told him, and then my agent was like, no, no, we're not going to, if, if, the, if the manager of this team wants to strong, uh, strong arm her, we're going to go to Sweden. And I was like, yeah, but we can stay here too. That's fine. At the time, I had no idea. I was like, okay, let's do Sweden. Because I was just excited. You know, I, I wasn't right. thinking. Like looking back now, I would have stuck to like, yo, I want to stay here because it's Holland, man. It's part of Rotterdam and they're in the yeah. area divisi as well. So that situation happened. And so because of that, my agent was like, okay, the Swedish team has been calling nonstop. They have an offer for you. And uh, uh, the part of Rotterdam, they want you to stay for another week, but then they might offer you a contract. They're trying to talk contract. And she was like, she doesn't want to stay there and keep talking because, you know, she's had a bad experience with the, uh, the player that was there. So we could take the contract in Sweden. So I was like, yeah, sure. I was just happy that I was getting offers, bro. So I was like, yeah, let's, right. let's take that. Because in my head, I'm thinking if I'm going to get, I mean, if I, I'm still going to get there. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm going to get there, it doesn't matter where I play. Because I was thinking I left from, like, from Georgia Southwestern to Sweden. Nah, so you, can, you left from the, from the summer league to Sweden, bro. <laughs> yeah, from the summer That's league. Yeah. summer league. Yeah, yeah, summer league, summer league to Sweden. So I was like, if I can make that jump, I can definitely make that leap to wherever I want to go if I have a good season. Yeah. So, that, so that's how I was looking at it when, uh, when going to, to, to Sweden. So that's how I ended up signing the contract uh, in Sweden. That's crazy that you mentioned that because, man, like, that, that would have been um, that generation of, like, those players that came out second in the World Cup, man. Uh, the Holland play players that were running like crazies. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, man. And there were actually like three guys on that uh, Sparta Rotterdam team that played for the Nigerian national team. Oh, wow. Well when I was there. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the captain as well at Sparta Rotterdam at the time, I think he, he might have played for the 
Dutch uh, national team, but he wasn't like a starter. He had like, like in the mouth. So they had some quite talented players in the team. And they had some guys from national team from Trinidad and Tobago. So most of the guys, they were like internationals. Yeah. They all played international level for their country. So they were like just top like specimen, bro. Like fitness wise, they were just like, just the fitness, the training, the passing, and bro, it was just, it was outrageous. Yeah, it's just like, like that's the main difference. Like, well, I guess the US don't really count as throw world. Yeah, yeah. But like when you're coming from Africa, South America, the Caribbean, or like Central America, Mexico, like, yeah. you know, you bring in talent, but when you cross, when you fly over the, to the other side of the pond, you know, the physical difference kicks in right away and you gotta get yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. anybody. And it's the opposite when they go uh, to South America and play like that. And, like, you know, the weather hits them. We, like, we like to pass, like, psychopaths and, like, little, yeah, little yeah. dribbles. But you still rewind uh, the conversation just a little bit. Mm. When you were trying out, uh, what were you staying at? Was it your own pocket? Your no, they, they, put me, they put me at a hotel, man. It was a really nice hotel. I got like full okay, breakfast cool. and TV. So Did they really... fit you? That was my next question. Did they fit you? Good? Oh, yeah, yeah. They fed me really well, man. The hotel, I got three meals from the hotel. And I could get whatever meal for lunch and whatever. Or oh, sometimes I had buffets for lunch. And sometimes I could just pick whatever I wanted for dinner. So I didn't pay for anything. They put me up at a hotel for like the whole time I was there. So it was gotcha. like a, yeah, so yeah. like back in track to um to you signing or you, or you deciding to stay in Sweden. Yeah. So what's that next conversation like? Like does your agent tell you, you know, we're going to go sign, when I talk to the coach, the president? Yeah. Like yeah. What, what, what's that process like? Can you educate us a little bit about like yeah. how how you cross that bridge basically from amateur to pro and that yeah. and that one day that makes the difference. Yeah, so the so the, the the agent called the the coach. I think the coach at this at this the team I went to, he was kind of like coach manager. So he made a lot of decisions like about like signing players, even though there was a sports director on the team. But the coach was like the one pretty much selecting the team. But sometimes in, in teams, it, sometimes the sports director or the manager gets the players and then sends it to the coach. But it was a coach that was like, yeah, I want this guy. And the coach actually had, a, he, he, had the, he signed the, the contract as well. But anyways, uh, my agent talked to the coach and they were like, okay, you guys come to Sweden. Uh, We'll send you guys the paperwork, check and make sure everything is okay. Uh, do a fitness test to check that, you know, no injuries and everything like that. So I did like a medical check and everything was fine. Check my heart rate uh, and everything was fine as well. So they were like, okay, uh, let's, let's go sign this contract. So I met the sports director. I met uh, the president of the club. And then I met uh, one of the, big, the ones, biggest sponsors of the, of the, of the team as well. So I met them and they were like, hey, welcome to, to the club. And it's really nice to have you. Uh, or do you like everything that's in the contract? I said, yeah, sure, it's good. I'm just happy. I was like, yo, I just, just put that pen to paper, man, before somebody <laughs> changes their mind. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, it was quite, you know, it's quite a like Exciting. Easy, easy process and stuff like that. But, and then so I, I signed the contract and, uh, and, and that was it. And I was a young shoe player. And that was my first uh, professional contract that I signed. So legally speaking, are you now a resident in Sweden at that moment? No, no. Are you no, getting no. paid as a foreign national? I'm getting paid as, uh, well, because at the moment, I, I didn't get paid at the time. I had to go to like uh, this immigration services. Mm -hmm. And then they used my, uh, my uh, um, football contract. Mm -hmm. I applied for permits and then automatically I get a two-year permit to stay in the country. And okay. so I get, I get paid like, like an employee, like someone who's working in that country and i paid gotcha. taxes taxes there as well and stuff like that how how easy was it to get the permit because i know like uh players oh, when you play in the yeah. Premier league you know mm. depending on like how many uh sometimes they have to be an international player or something to get a permit like there's a lot of yeah. paperwork in england so how is it in yeah. Spain? it was it was fairly easy actually like i think the most difficult places to get work permits it's in england and germany because of the standard of the league and so that's why it's so hard. And in, in England, for example, if you go there when you're under, you're under 18, then it's quite easy because you're not counted as, as, uh, as an, adult. Uh, an adult. So you can go there when you're under, under 18, it's easier. But if you go there over 18, then it's almost impossible to sign. Unless you're, even if like you're like a top, top player, they'll sign you and then send you on loan somewhere else, another country, while they're working on your permit. 
But in Scandinavia, it's not that difficult because Scandinavia is more like, it's like a stepping stone to the bigger leagues. So they don't, they don't have that many like difficult, like, uh, hard restrictions on like signing players because they actually want to get more international players to get their league, the leagues better and more known worldwide. So it wasn't, it was quite an easy, easy process actually in, in, uh, in Sweden. Gotcha. As far as, um, as far as salaries, uh, you don't have to talk numbers or anything like that, but, um, is your pay affected by if you are on the national team of your respected country or, uh, something of that sort? Oh yeah. Most, most of the guys who play national team level get paid more. I mean, the more experience you have, you get paid more for sure. And most of the guys, I think we had one guy on the national team, the Zambia national team, actually. And then we had a, a guy who had played in Sweden before, but not for a national team at the under 21s. But the guys who had more experience, who had been, been in the league for a while, they get, usually they get more, they get paid more than like me, for example, just coming in. So, yeah. But still, it was like a comfortable salary like really nice it was like the first time i actually got like i mean i've done like summer jobs in atlanta with jono actually just like so <laughs> just like so just so i could play just so i could play football and i got some i done summer jobs as well at school so that was like you know money for like you know hamburgers and stuff like that and juice and stuff but when i signed with uh with uh, young it was quite good money because i got like right away i, I got a car because i needed a car so it was like it was quite good money comfortable so yeah it was nice but was that now you eating like a doctor? Was it a club no. car? No, no, no. We had uh, we had a sponsor, so I got my own car. But the okay. the spon but like thing is with the car, one of the the sponsors for the for the team was a car company. And most of the players, if they wanted to, that's where they got their cars from. Okay. Because they got some kind of sweet deal and like specific cars that they wanted. If you wanted like a logo or your number on the car. You could have that uh, on there and you could change it like every month if you wanted to. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah. the, the first team that you played in, what, uh, what city in Sweden was it? I, it's called, uh, it was a, the city is called Jungschile. It's a small town. And it was like four, like I said, like 40 kilometers away from Gothenburg. And they had just been promoted to the top league when I went there. So it was is, there the any, is there any other clubs in, the, in that city or was that just the main club? That was the only club in the city. Then, the, the only other club like closest to us, uh, uh, EFK uh, Gothenburg, it's called, which is like one of the historically one of the biggest teams in, in Finland. I so mean, let me Sweden, ask you this: sorry. Yeah. you sign and you're you're officially you know in the league. Yeah. You're a professional athlete. Uh, what's the next move as far as um, training and scheduling and the agenda goes? Like, um, do you just get an email? Does somebody yeah. do you have a meeting? Yeah. Uh, what's your schedule going to be like for the next few uh, weeks or, or months? Yeah. Um, what, can you tell us a little bit about like, you know, your, basically your working schedule? What yeah. would they tell you? How did they live with I, you? I was quite, quite lucky because the coach really like took a liking to me. Like, and so he was very helpful like in every single step. Uh, first thing we're, we're going to do, because I was just staying in a hotel. So first thing we're doing was to, to get me an apartment. And an apartment closer because most of the guys, none of, I don't think any of the guys – lived in the city where the team was. Most of them lived in Gothenburg, which was like a big, big city or like midway to another town called Udevala, where I lived. So the first thing we we're going to do was find an apartment for preseason, which was like in the city where the team was. So it would have going to be easy for me because it was the winter. And then the goal was when the season starts, before the season started, I was going to move to the city, which was midway when I got to, when I was familiar with the whole, with the whole setting with the, how, the winter and everything. So first the coach, like, okay, we have to get you an apartment. And so, because that was part of my contract, but the team has to provide an apartment for me. So they got that, that sorted out for me and every, and then I started, that's when preseason started. So that was the first thing that kind of gets uh, sorted. And the coach gave me, uh, they give you, they give you a file with pretty much like all the different trainings, training times, and uh, uh, what like the different levels you have to maintain and, and things like that. And then, so that's, that's uh, the first things that you get. And so I remember when we got their first apartment, the coach gives me a file with all these things in it. And he was like, okay, just uh, chill. And uh, somebody will pick you up tomorrow morning for training and uh, have a good evening. And uh, uh, let's see you tomorrow, tomorrow morning for training. And so he left and I was like, 
I was sitting there in the apartment alone. I was like, wow, this is actually like happening. This is actually happening, you know? So, and then I remember like just sitting there. I couldn't sleep that first night because it was just like, it was just, it was surreal. And then I, I started calling like some friends in the U.S. called my parents. So that's pretty much all I did was just make calls. Oh, yeah, what did your dad say? Hmm? Oh, he was excited. He was excited. He was excited. He was excited, but he was like, you still have to finish school. I was like, I was like yeah, 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 dad, dad, I will, I will. Yeah, so, so, but yeah, everybody, so he was excited and like some friends were excited and then, and then next day, I get up, preseason starts. And that's the we start straight away with fitness. So the first like two weeks, it's no football. Just running through the woods and the snow. And I think those are, that's the most on the sports wise, that's the most difficult three months of my life ever in sports. Like because it was the transition just, period. The transition was horrible, man. It was oh my god. I would come from, like the training was just extremely tough. My body, because my body had never gone through like a professional training like that on a daily basis, like two times, two times, two times a day. And like, it's just like, you know, you have professionals like, you know, lifting coaches or like coaches are telling you how to like, you know, like stretch the right way and like running, how to run the right running technique. So it was all like just this new world for me. And so the first like three, four months, I think that was horrible. And then training was just horrible as well. Like the training part, even my, like training football was like, for example, when they're doing like, uh, like Rondo, they call it, which is like, like maybe like four outside and one in the, one in the middle and then just keep away. And I was just bad. Everybody was on, was on another level, man. And I just like, for the first three months, I was like, what, what? in the hell did I get myself into <laughs> because like technically these guys were just on another level passing everything was faster I mean like I thought like the me the way I played in the games that's how you know training that's how it's gonna be but like the trainings are just like everything is faster everything is sharper and my passes are getting cut off like quick the guys are smarter they're reading plays like faster than I've ever seen before and I was like, wow, this is another level. And I, I remember I'd go home, just like I'll take a ball home and just be kicking the ball towards the wall, like all night, just training at home, like just, just passing on the wall all the time. And just so I can catch up to the speed of the game, man, because all those guys, they've been in academies since they were like 10. And I was one of the youngest guys on the team. And so I actually started actually uh, playing with the reserves for like, about a month and then once the weather started to change i think it was like february no, february january where the weather started to change and then we decided to go on a preseason uh, um we took a preseason um a trip to cyprus and then it was warm like crazy and then that's when i kind of like came alive with training because the weather was warm and it was much better for me and then like speed training i was just like killing everybody and then i started like catching up to the speed of play it means like maybe four months in i started catching up to the speed of play and everything was going going good as preseason games i was scoring every preseason game so i was kind of com coming alive like fourth fifth month of, of while, while i was there and then uh, when the season started i was excited i was like you know i want to be i can't wait i'm going to be starting first first game First game of the season start, I'm on the bench, bro. I was so mad because I'd been balling all like all winter and preseason. And but they had a guy on the team who had like been there for like, I don't know, like 15, 20 years. And he was like, he was from the city. And I there was no chance I was gonna play. Looking back now, with the experience I know with the experience, yeah, with the experience I know now, or I have now, I know why I wasn't playing. Because the guy was from the team, he was like, like an idol, but he was much older. And I was like, yeah. So that I kind of knew, okay, this wasn't gonna happen. So the first game I didn't play. I come, I came on like we actually played this uh, Hammerby, and there was an American player there actually, uh, Charlie Davis. No, oh, yeah, Charlie Davis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there was an American. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, there was an American player there, Charlie Davis. I played against. So that was my first game. I came in the last like five, six minutes. 
and didn't do much. And I wasn't happy at all. And I talked to my agent right after the, that, that same night and she was pissed as well because I've been doing quite well preseason and everybody thought like, oh, I was going to start. So second game, same thing. Third game, same thing. And then the fourth and fifth game, they put me into play, but it just wasn't working. And then the coach was like, call me aside like one day after training. He was like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just a little bit frustrated. Like, yo, I thought I should have been playing. And then now when stuff is not going good, then you want to put me in? Like, no, I want to play like from the beginning. So we, we had a proper discussion. And he was like, okay, uh, let's see how this week of training goes. And then we'll decide like what, what to, how to move on next. So the next week of training, one of our uh, defenders gets, gets injured. And uh, the coach was like, hey, would you want to like play it in like, you know, to, because we were playing like 5v5. And so I played, with, I played with my team as a striker and we were out. And then a defender got injured for the, it was like three teams, 5v5. So a new team came on. And, but one of the players from the team that was on that had won the game, the defender got injured. He was one of our captains. And I told the coach, hey, can you put me there? And he was like, yeah. So I was angry like crazy. Man. Like, I just played mad and nobody was getting past me. I was tackling everybody, just getting the ball going forward. And then after that training, the coach calls me in his office. He's like, uh, we have a cup game coming up. In, uh, would you mind playing as a central defender in that cup game? Oh, wow. and, I, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to play. Because I wasn't supposed to play. I was going to be on the bench. And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I'm going to do it. And then we were playing this EF Koyetebori at the time, which was, they had, I think they were one of the best teams in, in like Swedish history. And they had one of the, the top strikers in the league. And I think he was worth like almost like his transfer fee was like, uh, I think 20 million kroners. And I think that was like 10 million. Oh no, like five, 5 million euros or something like that. So he was like a top, top notch guy. And uh, I shot him out like that game or the cut game. Like he couldn't, I couldn't let him breathe at all. Like every time he got the ball, I was, you know, like hitting him in the back or just stealing the ball and attacking. So, but I was just playing off like, like so that anger. Running through the woods was paying off. Bro, yeah, I was just playing off like anger and being pissed that I haven't been like, I haven't been, I haven't been playing much. And just, yeah. So, and then I did very well. And then the coach was like, okay, we'll play the reserve games. I have two reserve games coming up. We want you to play in those reserve games. And because we had a break from the season, playing those reserve games, we want to see how you do. So I played in the reserve games and I was just playing very well. I would just steal the ball and just dribble all the way forward. Like I just used to do that every time. And so the coach was like, okay, uh, we want to change your position and we want you to play as the central defender. I was like, I asked him, I'm going to be playing 90 minutes. He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, put me in. So I actually took the, one of the captain's spot on the team. So that's how oh, I yeah, started playing as a central defender. And we used to play like with five in the back because I was kind of like a, cent a defender, but I could just like kind of, the coach gave me the freedom to just like go. Like, so when I got the ball, I almost like, I almost like, like, like almost, almost like a midfielder in a way when I, when I had the ball. And then sometimes I'll just dribble, go all the way and try to make stuff happen. So, so that's how I, I, I kind of switched again to, to playing central defender. Yeah. What do you feel most comfortable at? I'm always going to be a striker at heart, bro. Like, sorry. Like, yeah, that's just you. Yeah, just like, of course, but I like being, a, I like being a defender as well. Cause you, that's your talent, you, though. Like, yeah. players like you, there are very few that can play a bunch of positions. Yeah. And do it good, you know. Like, yeah. And, and then a few, I actually played also as a proper midfielder as well, when a, f a few games in Sweden. Sweden as well. So if there was a problem somewhere. The coach was like, do you want to go? So, yeah, just, just plug me in. You know, I wasn't even thinking about like, because my mentality was like, I love scoring goals. I love to play. But when they were like, when I, when, when I, made, when I was made to believe that I wasn't going to be playing like 90 minutes, but then the only way I was going to do that was if I was playing like other positions. I was like, I don't even care if I'm scoring. Like, I just, I'm going to be on that starting 11. And so I just started playing like a central defender, played uh, um, uh, on the three in the back line, plus I played in, in the midfield, and then some games play as a striker. So just anywhere where there was a problem, I was playing, and I just started playing 90 minutes. That's, that's very so, wise of, yeah. of you to do at that age too, man, because like yeah. a lot of younger players' egos, like they yeah. don't understand that, you know, a, a man is supposed to be where he's needed the most. Exactly. Not where, you, not where you want to be necessarily. 
yeah, yeah. I just want, I just wanted to play, man. Like, and you did that. Anything that was gonna give me like ninety minutes, I'm on there. I don't care. It's goalkeeper, right back, left back. I want to get the ninety minutes call. <laughs> so, give us yeah. the gloves. Hey, give oh. it to me, man. As long as I'm playing, as long as I'm playing ninety minutes, I, I, I don't care. Just put chug me. Do you down. remember? Do you remember um, how many games exactly it took you to start? You said maybe oh, like five or six. Like yeah, about five, five games. Yeah, I, gotcha. because I was coming off the bench for those five games, and then we had a break. But in between that break, it's because we had a cup game. And then it was during that cup game where I, when I played that as a central defender, I did really good. When we came back from the game, from the, from the, from the break, mm -hmm. then I, my first game back, I played a central defender. I did very, very, very well. So, yeah. So how, how many games do you have left that season? Uh, we, we played like overall. As a defender, we played, at least. Oh, as a defender, I played like, I'm going to have to check the stats, but I played maybe 12 games as a defender, maybe three or four. Usually about four. what, Nick, there is like what, how many games in a season? Like 18, 21 games? <laughs> yeah, if you, if you combine all together, it's like maybe 28. Okay. In, including like cup games and stuff. Right. Oh, yeah, I played, you guys are uh, doing like a league, cup. League and two, two different cup games. So, gotcha. yeah, two different cops as well. So, I think Nick had a question. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, I was – well, I actually have two. Since, and I'll, I'll ask this one, and then I'll go back to something before. But uh, you guys had a proper winter break, though, right? Like, you had a lengthy one. Because, you know, like England, they yeah. have a winter break. And then yeah, yeah. Spain has a short winter break. But I think you guys have, like, a long one, right? Yeah, yeah. We had, we have like, two months – Two months break. And that's because you know, of the months. weather, right? Is that just because it's the weather because of the up? it's because of the weather? Because you can't play. You can't play like in um in like November and December. Did and you that's why my use, what? Did you ever use orange balls? Because I saw when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, we did. Balls? We did. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we did. We used orange balls. Yeah, because yeah, it's snow, right? Balls. Yeah, because of the snow, you know, like so you had to use orange balls because some of the time, even if they take the the some of the pitches had like uh like a, a heating system underneath. But even still, like sometimes there's ice on like certain areas in preseason, so it's dangerous as hell. And plus, all around the pitches, usually in preseason games, it's like snow all around. So sometimes we use like you know, different color balls and stuff. Yeah. So, so I'm my, right here. I'm listening. I'll be right back. I'm right here. I'm no, listening. Okay. My next question for you was going to be because I know you said you wanted to play wherever you were going to get a 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded like when Pedro asked the question that you were primarily used as a defender. Is that correct? Yes. So would you say, because I know being versatile would definitely get you options to plug yeah. in if, if somebody needed you. But I've heard like, you know, I mean, I'm kind of like a soccer nerd when it comes to history. And I've yeah. heard people like Phil Neville or John O'Shea, because I'm like a big Man United fan. They've always said that, you know, they like being versatile because it gave them options to get plugged in. Yeah. But they always felt like that kind of hurt their career a little bit because they weren't seen as the first choice. Do you feel like you ran into that problem or was it the opposite? Because I know not everybody's experience is the same. Yeah, I think it was good and bad. Bad because I think if I was given a chance to grow as a striker, I knew I would have, I would have been like, I would have done very well. I knew that. But then again, at the moment, I just wanted to play. But it, so it kind of helped me to where I was always on the starting 11. I knew I was going to be on the starting 11 because I had several, like, there were several places I could get fit in and people get injured. And also, like, if I know, like, when I was training, I knew like I was training for more than one positions, so it gave me more options. But then again, the thing that I really wanted to do, and I knew if I was playing as a striker, you score a lot of goals, it's easier for you to go to like, you know, where I wanted to go to, which is like England or Germany and stuff like that. So, but I mean, I think there's, there's, some, there's some pros and cons for that. It just depends, you know, it depends what situation you're in. And I, I did very well as a, as a defender. And I was like, I finished like, uh, fourth in the voting for young player of the year that year after after switching switching positions and then i even got uh interest from this uh, energy cottbus in uh in the bundesliga at the time so again like you know it had its uh its good good sides but then the bad sides as well because as a striker if you score like 15 20 goals it doesn't matter you're, you're going to a big league like easy you're getting picked up and that that was and it's much easier to go somewhere as a striker than any other position. If you're scoring goals, someone's going to find you. Easy. 
So, but there's a lot of other technical aspects in playing other positions that you know may hinder that. Was this first club in Sweden the club where you got to play in the uh, qualification phase of the Champions League, or was that later? No, that was like my third club in in, in Finland where I get uh, get to play in the qualifications of the Europa League. Yeah, was it? It was Europa. It wasn't Champions League for some reason. I thought it was Champions League. I, no, I, no, it was I, Europa, I Europa, Europa Europa League qualification. Europa League. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's still a big deal. So. Yeah, we, it was, a lot, of, wrong, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, man. It was crazy. The experience. But, um, of, yeah. What what bonuses do defenders get like that? Because you know, if you're a striker, you get bonuses for scoring. Yeah. Like, what kind of bonuses will you get if you get any? Well, usually bonuses for defenders are for like clean sheets, and that's that's the most what defenders get. Like, I don't see there's no any other like, you know, bonuses that I see defenders. You know, getting outside of that, I think clean sheets was the was the main one. I like if the keeper gets dribbled out and then like that dude shoots and then you like do the same with your face. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> uh, kind of like, like kind of like the like champ, you know, like super campeones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, all your yeah. you just like like Subasa and you just like get that cleared out. Yeah, yeah. It was m- m- mostly like like uh, like clean sheets. That's the only thing for defenders. So gotcha. Yeah. But for attackers, it's like you get your it's easier because assist and goal, so you get two two options. But defenders is all like, it's all well goals. Everybody gets some people put like defenders put like goals as well, but that's rare for for defenders to go goals so unless you're like one of those defenders that is known for scoring in corners and stuff. Then you're like, yo, I'm putting that in, you know? Right. So, but yeah, but mostly it was clean sheet. Yeah. Well, I forgot to ask you. You said that you had a bunch of coaches. Yeah. Uh, for like you know working out, exercising, st- even stretching. Yeah. Uh, was anybody in charge of your nutrition individually or as a group? Yeah, as a team. Actually, my first team, not really. I mean, we all ate. I, everybody had lunch at the club. So your breakfast, pretty much, that was you. At home, you had your breakfast, and then you come, you train. After training, everybody has lunches together, and then you go home, and then that's up to you. But then they advise when we went to the gym, the physical trainers at the gym, they advised like, oh, there's yeah, different supplements that you can kind of take and stuff like that. So, yeah, but it wasn't, I think in um, when I was a team in, I we went to Europa League, they had more uh, stricter regulations on like nutrition and things of that nature. But not with the first team, no. Gotcha. And that lunch, what was that lunch like uh, in the average week? Oh, it was, we had a lot of pasta, a lot oh, of really? pasta. Yeah, a lot of pasta. It's actually good, carbs. man, like carbs. a lot of carbs. Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of pasta. And then every once in a while, we'll have like some traditional Finnish food, like uh, like salmon and potatoes, and then some weird Finnish stuff that I don't like at all, <laughs> that had pineapples and some kind of like uh, pasta sauces, but a lot of different kinds of pastas. Gotcha. Mo- mo- mostly, yeah. And the Swedish are not known for their food choices. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. What supplements uh, were you uh, recommended? Like, was it like the basic stuff, like pre-workout, it, proteins, vitamins? It was, yeah, it was just pre-workout and then like after workout. It was like quite basic stuff. So gotcha. nothing, yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing special. So how many years do you, do you stay with your first club? So I was there for two years. And then uh, when the coach was uh, going to leave the club, and he was the one who brought me in, and he was the one that kind of like guided, like he was like one of the closest persons to me. He helped me transition like crazy. So I was like, if he's leaving, I don't want to stay here either. So that's how I ended up, because I, had, I trusted him, and he gave me the opportunity, like my first like, job, like, you know. And so I was really like, attached to him by the hip in a way. So when he was like, yeah, I'm going to leave. And so I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to stay here if you're leaving. And uh, so he said, okay, I have a friend who's coaching this team in, uh, in Finland. And uh, he's a British guy as well. So, and he will understand my style of play and everything. And I was like, yeah, sure, I trust you. Let's do this. Okay. And so that's how, that's how I came to Finland. So how does that uh, next level of negotiation happen? Your agent picks up the phone, uh, yeah. uh, get to the uh, negotiations. Do you get to have a salary increase, decrease, stays the same? Actually, that's not. That's when now the politics of agents come into everything. Actually, my agent. Actually, we kind of fall out. I had a fallen out with my agent because 
we're trying to move to another to other like countries but then like nothing was happening at the time and my coach was like you know what i'll help you move to this to, to finland so i actually ended the contract with my first first agent and then i got i didn't have an agent at the time i just used my coach because he could like yeah, like do contracts or with other teams so the contract i did to in finland was actually my former coach and the president and the coach of the new team oh wow yeah it was it was stupid it was, like <laughs> stupid. it was stupid i would never recommend that for any any player it was it was the most dumb stupid thing i ever did what what what, what was it stupid can you tell us it was, it was horrible because like I would have, with an agent, you can get so much more leverage and you can get so much a better contract. Even though I had a really good contract, I got paid more than the, than the team I left from. But looking back, I was like, oof. I think there were some things that I could have added to the contract that, you know, because PlayStation. They, were, they, want, they wanted me really bad, but, you know, but all in all, it was a good contract. It was a really good contract. But just like I think I, I I should have had like a professional professional agent. Gotcha. Yeah. So how long did it take you to get an agent again? Um. After that, the agent that I got actually was through my former uh, coach from Sweden, and so this was when uh, I got interest while I was in the team. In the first time I moved here, the other team that I went to the Europa League with, they were interested in me, and this was the year before they went to the Europa League. And so they contacted me and then uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to try and use an agent for this one. And then I used an agent who was a friend of my, uh, my coach and they used to play together. So I used him uh, to find a new deal with the new team. So that's how I got an agent. Yeah. You learned your lesson. Yeah. Again, another stupid mistake. <laughs> 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 Yo, I've made so many like, dumb mistakes when it comes to contracts man and i hope that's something which i hope to pass down to to different like you know professional players like i really trusted the you know agents that they were gonna like you know take me to a next level but never happened so they were just trying to either get their money and get you know get the hell out so but i realized that like when it was kind of too late because the agent that i signed with to move to the new team the team was already interested in me and i knew that so it's not like they found a team for me. All I just needed someone to negotiate the money part of the contract because I didn't want to like, when, you, when a player negotiates a contract with a team, it kind of creates this bad blood between you and the, the manager or you and the coach. Yeah. Because that transfers to the training or to the games because if, if you are hard at doing the negotiations and trying to like get what you deserve and you're going back and forth, that doesn't just disappear. When you stop, when you're part of the team, they remember that, and they try and like almost carry that that a little bit to your playing. And so, I just wanted to use a manager to to get to get that to, uh, an agent to get that done. So I used this agent, and we got it again. I got a really good contract. So I got a really good contract. But then I because when they got that good contract, they were calling me to ask me, "Hey, you think this number is enough?" I was like, "No, no, no, it's not enough. I want more." And then he'll go back and say he wants more. So pretty much I was kind of like negotiating my own contract in a way. And so, and the agent didn't go and find the team. The team came to me and I said, oh, by the way, this is the talk to this agent. So pretty much I just gave somebody like 10% for nothing. Oh, talking about the fee, yeah, the commission. Yeah, for nothing. You make your own research in that moment and like talk to your teammates um you know google the players in that team see what their salary is like no you have a, how do you make an idea of like um you know how your worth uh, financially comes up because you can't find that anywhere what the players make it's like you can find that at a time so for me it's, i was just going based on what i was i'd made before and what i thought my my worth was so i doubled my salary from what i was making the last team i got a good sign on bonus so in my head i was thinking that's pretty good you know so i wasn't like again i wasn't again uh, uh, that's what i say if i had a proper agent they would have been going based on the players that they had in the team and not based on what i, I last made which would have been much better for me because i probably would have had in triple or quadruple what i was making but i ended up making double because i was just going based on what i made in the last team 
and so was the agent who wasn't like you know aware of what was going on at the time as well so that's how i end up um yeah signing on that new team that went that was uh played in the europe europa league qualifications so you go you join this new group again and yeah your um your position like do you have to fight for it again or is it more no no it was set man it was set the first team when i moved to sweet to fit to to finland the first team it was set like starter throughout the whole like the whole the whole two years i was there any injuries i had one injury i had a knee injury uh, i had surgery for that i'm a rat, meniscus injury on the right knee Ooh. and then i had a toe injury as well which uh there was some bone that was supposed to be cut off from my uh my big toe on the left foot but in sweden i had like three different injuries i had a hamstring injury i had a meniscus on the, on the right knee and then i had a a thigh sprain as well. Yeah, and then I had a concussion as well. So yeah, that was oh, in Sweden. Shit. I had a concussion. I, I kept playing with that. I kept playing with I got a hit, like a hit, I got like a contact. I, got, I jumped for a ball with another guy and we bought a headbutt. But I, I came back right in though. <laughs> I came back right in. I just was seeing stars for a few days at nights when I went home. But I didn't oh, wow. care. I didn't care, man. But now I know it's a concussion looking back. But at the time, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't care, bro. So, but yeah, I had quite a few injuries my first two years. But it was kind of those nagging injuries that I just kept playing with. Again, another stupid mistake I made. Instead of making sure I took care of the injuries that I had, I just kept powering through those injuries, taking tons and tons of pain medications, uh, cortisone shots, like pretty much anything just to play. So I, for the first two years, I played through a few injuries, pain medication, no problem. So, yeah. How much does the the manager or the doctors of the team um, advise you on playing or not? Are they trying to make it so you play no matter what? Or are they basically saying like, hey, you can go in, but this could be an effect of you playing? Yeah, coaches, coaches work for the uh, managers. Uh, doctors work for the team. So if a coach knows, even though a coach might know like you're not ready to play, they might tell you, oh, if you feel like, you're good like of course you do all the tests fitness things and everything but if you have those little small nagging injuries then they're like yeah, yeah it's, it's fine you can play it won't get worse but that's that's bs whenever and you know, it doesn't matter what injury someone say it doesn't get worse it does get worse because even if that, that specific injury doesn't get worse you comp your body compensates because for example you start leaning towards your right your right foot for example if you have a left foot injury because so you, now you're overworking your right foot. So you might not get the same, you might not like uh, make the first injury worse, but you're overworking the right foot and you might get a new injury with the right side of your foot or something there. So that was the kind of, those things I used to kind of battle with. And there were injuries where like, uh, like the toe thing where they had to cut off a, a piece of the bone, it was like 50-50. So where they were like, they can cut this bone off, but it's not sure that the injury that you have is gonna go away. So I'm like, well, if the doctor's telling me it's 50-50, I might as well just take injections and play. Yeah. You know, because I don't know if I, if I take, if I do the surgery, then I'm out for like two months and I come back and it's the same injuries and like gone, then it was a waste of two months. So I was like, yeah, just hit me with an injection, bro. I'm good. <laughs> I'll go back in there. So again, another mistake. What was it like exactly? What, did they cut off the bone or was it just this? Yeah, it was a, a bone. It was bone. It was like an ingrown bone. Like it's still up to, to this day. I never had like they cut it, but it still kind of like grew again. It wasn't supposed to. Are you so serious? Still, yeah. So if I wear really tight, really tight boots now, when I play, like if it's really tight and I hit the ball, my, that's why I never use my left foot. Like <laughs> So unless to like control the ball. But if I wow. get a hit... If I get a hit on that now, even up to this day, I can't wear like, like shoes that are really tight because of that. So, but yeah, it was, yeah. I, and then I had the knee injuries and then the concussion and then little minor like strains, which I just kept playing with. And, but I kept, I played too, like most of those things. But, but Man, there was a uh, player, uh, I don't remember his name um, or the league that he plays at because I think he's still yeah. active. Like he had like some, Something kind of like like you're saying, like growing out of like his Achilles or like his heel. So like he made okay. holes on the back of his shoes. Okay, I had, they actually had to get a special shoe for me. Yeah, a special football shoe. Well, I think it was a what shoe? I'm trying to remember. That thing looked like a boat. 
<laughs> I can't remember what 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 brand it was. Uh, no, it was it was this was it Gadora maybe? It was. Uh, yeah, it was this. Yeah. It looked it looked like a boat, bro. I just it was the most <laughs> horrible looking thing I'd ever seen. But because it had like the shoe had the the plastic thing at the front, so that when the the leather it couldn't push in. Gotcha. So the toe, so the toe was protected, and that was the natural way of the shoe. But nobody was wearing that shoe. It was just like it was a you. Special, I, don't, I don't know why. And I look, it looked horrible, man. Uh, I serious question. And it was, how many, so. how many pairs did you sell of that shoe? <laughs> how many pairs of shoes did I sell? Uh, actually, I don't, actually, I don't think I, I don't think anybody wanted to buy those. those, those <laughs> shoes, like nobody wanted to wear those shoes. But I did very well in them. I really enjoyed them because. They kept me my my uh, that injury safe for like the, almost a year and a half that I was there. So was do you still use them today? Do you still have a pair? No, 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 no. Those are gone. Man. Immediately I left Sweden. I was like, no, nah, I can't. <laughs> I just I just started taking pain pain medication. Gotcha. Another horrible, another horrible mistake. Mistake. Yeah, you, you can get hooked on that. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, I'm gonna do a little shift here, but. Uh, did you ever get any attention from either uh, Cameroon or the United States as far as national team because you're a presence in Europe or is that yeah. something that just never really came I about? Think, I think there was some interest from the U.S. And because they were tracking, they were tracking all the players. I think there was this website called, what's it called? Um, it's about, it, they, they track like U.S. players that are overseas. And so a lot of the guys, and Charlie Davis was quite on the national team level at that time. So I was getting tracked by that website and there were some talks about it, but I never got any call. And for Cameroon, like, yo, there's too much politics, man. That's it's pay for play over there. So, yeah, that's so I, didn't, I didn't, and I wasn't going to be paying anybody to play football. So that I didn't think about. Plus Cameroon has like tons so of much talent football. too. I know if you're not playing in like the Bundesliga or like the English Premier League, or one of the top leagues, or if you're not paying mad money, you're not joining, you're not getting to the Camo National team. Yeah, you know, so, like you guys produce like some crazy strikers, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Wingers. We have, yeah, like, we had some good players. Like so. midfielders. Yeah. So like, there were some. You got way some, too many of those. Yeah, there were some talks about the U.S. national team, but nothing like, nothing concrete or nothing that was brought to my attention. But there were some like talks here and there. But, well, um, did you ever consider in Finland? nationalizing or something because you know like you hear these stories of players yeah. they play in a country and then yeah. you know, like i'm brazilian but I'm, i know i'm not gonna make the brazilian national team so i nationalize as you know i'm from switzerland and then i play for switzerland or something like that no i always wanted to play either for the u.s or cameroon though know? that was my that was my so there's no option it was just basically those two or nothing yeah yeah like I, if I, being yeah, the I blackest Finnish player was never your idea no, I wasn't, man. I was thinking I wanted you know, U.S. or Cameroon, and U.S. was my number one target, bro. That was that was it. I wasn't thinking any other country. So, but yeah, oh, man. Was, yeah, yeah. So that was that was my mindset at the time. But did you? This is this is random. I meant to ask you this, but you know, you guys kept going. I didn't want to mess with the flow. But when you played against Charlie Davies, uh, did he talk to you at all? Did you talk to him? Nope. Okay, because I was always wonder, like you know, when uh, there there's two people from the same country uh, yeah. playing in the same league, not in that country, not in the country yeah. that they were living in, if they would, you know, make any kind of conversation after the game. It, but, it, you know. it, it happens a lot, but he was like a big. He was a star at that time over there, but we played him three times, and maybe we said hello to each other, but not Nothing not much after that. Nothing after that. But I I think. In Finland, I talked to every single one of American players that came to Finland. I, I, like, I know them. I know a lot of the American guys that come to play here from the U.S. Or like even when I was in Sweden, the goalkeeper there was an American guy as well. So we had a close relationship. And we talked, yeah. So in Sweden, I didn't really talk to any of the Americans that were there that were not on the team. I mean, I wanted to, but I don't know. They just didn't talk to me, I guess. But in Sweden, in Finland, yeah, I made sure, I made sure to, to like, you know, talk to the guys because I was a little bit older and I knew what when I was younger, you know, I didn't get that kind of like the ropes. I didn't, I didn't I, yeah, I didn't approach any, I wasn't approached by any older like American guys that were in the league then. There were maybe like two. So when I got older, I always made it a point like if there's any American coming here, 
I'll make sure and talk to them, get the number, message them. So most of the American guys that came to Finland, I knew most of them, I had the numbers, and I talked to them every once in a while. So. Okay, so who would you say um, in your professional career, who was the player that you played against that you, I don't want to say in awe of, but you knew it was going to be a tough match? Is there a player, like, I don't, I don't necessarily need to know the player's yeah. name, but, you know, somebody that, like, that, that guy was amazing. Yeah, there's a... There is actually maybe three or four players. I played against this guy, is, uh, Ola Toivanen, his name is. He played for the Swedish national team now. He's a striker. And uh, he was like, he was big. He was like my height, but so smooth, like touch. And he was like deceptive fast. And his, his, his one touch finish was like just amazing, man. And he was, he was like, you, he'll be like close to you, but like, Immediately you look somewhere, he's gone, bro. Like, so he was like, he was kind of, he was like a, a handful for sure. And then um, I also played with this guy in, um, here in Finland. I was a striker now for, for, for what's that team again? The striker Finnish national team. Damn, I can't remember his name. What's his name again? He sucks. Uh, he plays for, in, in, the, in, in England. A Finnish the player? Only Finnish, the only Finnish striker. I can't believe I, I can't remember his name. Now I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Keep going. Temu Puki. Well, go real quick. Temu P Puki. Puki. Temu Puki. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him, him. So he was, he's a very good finisher. So I played against him here. But the person I, that I played the most that was just like out of this world was Henrik Larsson. And he was like... Oh, Henrik Larsson. Left. Yeah, yeah. He had just left, left Barcelona. That, after he left Barcelona, he came to play for his uh, hometown team in um in a uh, housing force it's like housing borough uh, housing force ef so i played against him and he was very like tricky like even though it was like he his touch was like his one two touch was like he would touch the ball and he'll be gone and anything in the air it's it's gone in the net and we played that game and we won two zero and i completely shut him down and he told me to f off during the game i was so happy I called, some of the, <laughs> I called some of the guys in the, I called my dad, I called them my former coach. I said, yo, Henry Glasson told me to F off. I was so happy that he said that. <laughs> uh, follow him on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was so, I don't think he had Instagram at the time, but it was really like, it was really cool. Like he told me to F off. And I some of that, a compliment, yeah. Yeah, I grew up watching, watching him because I was like a pest. I was just like kicking him. Like I was all over him and he didn't score that game. And he was like, he would finish like, second or third in the league that year and oh. in goal scoring yeah so i was quite uh, that was like one of the highlights you know for me it was it was really cool to, to, for him to say like f you because i know that was the team. end of his career so i can only imagine yeah yeah but he would have been like at his prime yeah man oh he no was, i would have been another sauce yeah he was <laughs> he was like his intelligence was just on another level peak like, level yeah but it was the year where he just left barcelona and came right but his intelligence you could tell like you know, mentally, he's like on another planet. Like his movements and stuff like that, you know, his command of like the whole game. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, holding the ball, like one touch, he's finishing. Like those, you can just see like, this, yeah, this is something else. What, what position did he play in that game? He played as a, like a second striker. Okay. So he was, so he was kind of allowed to roam around. He's like checking. And that was, and that was as a defender, those are the worst kind of players. I hate those kind of players. Because they're never around next to you, so they're always like in between you and the and the, and the defensive midfielders, and mm -hmm. they get they go wide and then they come running around you. So you never like, and especially him. Sometimes you never see him uh, see him coming because you're focused on the striker most of the times, and he's like playing as a number ten. Or all of a sudden, he's on the wing, and you can't go out there with him, you know. And so it's it's, he's, it's very tricky. He was very kind of a tricky player. Where it's like just all around the four defenders and always behind. The central, like a uh, defensive midfield. So, how long do you stay with your, uh, your with your second team? Uh, you know, with, with, well, the, with your the, first the, team in Finland. Oh, uh, the first team in Finland I was there for two years, and then the second team I was there also for two years, which is the one which went to Europa League. So, how did that transfer happen? Yeah. Well, I just like I said, that was the chance. What inspired you to transfer? Um, well, again, to the, to the third team was because of the Europa League. They were playing in the Europa League qualification. So you wanted like, that. I was like, yo, this is an opportunity for me to, like, you know, I, we, all, we all grew up watching Champions League. 
grew up watching Europa League. So I was right. like, you know, this is like, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity for me. Did they approach you or you approached them? Yeah, we played against them. And then right after the game, because I shut down their striker. So right after the game, the coach came and talked to me. No, the managers came and talked to me. It's like, really good job. I like how you play. And uh, he was like, yeah. And then I was like, okay, that's good. And then like a week later, we played against them. And then after that, they were like, who's your agent? And then so that's how that kind of happened. It was like right after the game. So, and then so they, 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 they approached me first. And then that's how I moved end up moving there and again like I said the agent I didn't have an agent at the time but then I used somebody who was like a friend of uh, one of the coaches that I knew to get the deal done and how long you stay with that team two years as well two years as well two years and then towards the last year I started having that's when like my injuries started kicking in because I decided to like uh, the last year there I decided to start to start um, shutting down pain medications and taking any kind of injections. And so my body started reacting like really horrible to that. So all the injuries, all the injuries I thought had gone away were just there. They were just being, <laughs> they were just there. Just, just knocking the on the door. Yeah, the pain medication was like just, you know, keeping the pain away, but the injuries were still there. Oh, so man. I started going through a period where like all this, I started doing just, I was having more rehab than I was actually training. So I'll go to, I'll do rehab on Monday and very little training, football training, if any, with the team on Tuesday, Wednesday rehab, and then like, uh, like Thursday, no training at all, just rehab. And then Friday, very little training, if any, and then just ready for game on Saturday. So that's, so out of a week, I would train football like one day and the rest wow. is like training and rehab. The race is like physical training to prepare me for a game. And How many I, injuries were you dealing with at that time? I, I uh, did my had a MCL strain. MCL strain on my right knee and then also a meniscus tear on the left knee. And, but it was during the season and uh, I was like, okay, I'm just going to power through. And the team was like, yo, just power through. We really need you for the season. After the season, we're going to do, we're going to make sure you have the surgery and everything is good. And so after the season ended, my contract was over. They were like, yeah, we can't sign you because you're injured. So, and meanwhile, I was playing through the whole season because they were like, yeah, just play through the season. And then, you know, you have your surgery after and then we'll discuss a new contract. But then there was OBS because after the season, I had to like, do surgery by myself because I had no contract, pay for my own surgery. So I went like six months without playing football. Just like having surgery, like trying to cut, staying off uh, pain medication. And because of, for a while there, I was almost like addicted to like some powerful pain medication where yeah. I couldn't go. I, I was eating pain medication for like, like two, like some of the strongest stuff. Two with, for breakfast, two with lunch, two for dinner. Like just... I was wow. popping pills like like easy, and that was like so when I took the six seven months off just to like train my body again, stay off pain medication, and uh, it was a tough few like six seven months because I wasn't playing football. It's just like I had to heal from all the injuries that I've, I'd had the previous four years that I've been kind of like playing with them, and uh, yeah, so I took six months off, and then um, then I had an opportunity to actually to come to the MLS. But I didn't go through. What, uh, mm -hmm. Talk, talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit if you want to um, expand on yeah. the opportunity. Yeah. Um, a former coach from Georgia Southwestern State knew uh, a coach from the Real Salt Lake. So they asked me, they've been interested. We've been talking for a while about it. I was like, no, no, no. I want to stay, stay in, in, uh, in Finland. I want to stay. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had interest from other teams. But I've always, agents have said, oh, we might want to talk to this team, might be interested. I was, no, no, I want to stay in Finland because my goal was to like go to like the bigger European country. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking if I went back to the US, it's going to be harder for me to go to U2, like the UK or England. But after being out for six, seven months, I was like, okay, like if they're interested in me in Real Salt Lake, then these coaches hook, hooked it up. Let me go there. They wanted me for a tryout. And so I went there for like a week. I trained with them, played a game, everything went quite well. 
we started talking about the contract and then they were like, we want you to stay for like uh, a week and a half more and we're gonna go to Arizona. I was like, nah, man, I'm not gonna do trial for three and a half weeks. Like that's not, I've been there already for like a week and a half. I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a trial for like three weeks or three and a half weeks. That's not happening because I, I'm like, in Europe, I had a trial for like two weeks. After one week, they already started talking to me about contract. But over there, they were talking about contract, but wanted me to stay for two more weeks. And in Arizona, I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna go back to Sweden. I mean, to Finland, where there was another team that I was interested. That's how I came back to, to Finland and I played in the team, not in the first league, but the second league. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So like, how are you doing right now, physically? Uh, physically, I need to have like two more surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to have uh, two more surgeries. Actually, one on my right, and which is still hurting. I can squat all the way down. Oh, and, for real? Yeah, I think it's, I, have a, I had an MCL tear, and then I have a meniscus that has to be done. And then I have a, also an ACL injury, which I have to do a surgery for. So about two surgeries I need to do. And then I actually do, did a surgery uh, last year. I don't know if you can see that, a scar. I yeah, yeah, I see it, yeah. I broke my wrist. I broke my wrist in like four different places. How do you and do that? I, I need to do, I, I fell and I fell on my, during the game. I jumped for a header and I got like, someone under caught me. So I landed on my hand and I broke that. And then I still have to do a corrective surgery for that as well. So yeah, still got a few things to, to do, even though I've been played in like, Almost a year and a half, two years. So, gotcha. Yeah, yo, like a lot of people don't realize this, and like even people who play, like, yo, the the physical toll on your body, like, and like Nick, Nick and I, we talk a little bit, like slightly about it before talking to you. Like, people don't realize this, man. Like, you read a few biographies on soccer players, mm -hmm. and like they all have a section when they're like, yeah, like, just taking shots to the ankles and just. But you know, it's, it's taking hard. pills and all yeah. that. Like it's it's amazing. Like for anybody watching this, man, like go go work out like twice a day for one week, see how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like go run like three miles a day, like twice a day or yeah. something like that. Like but yeah, <laughs> see how you it, feel. It, yeah, it's horrible, man. Like the thing is the thing is and I that that's when I started appreciating professional athletes a little bit more when I started when I became a professional athlete. Because mm -hmm. like all everybody gets to see Sunday. Yeah. Or Saturday. They don't yeah. see Monday through Friday. And yeah. sometimes someone might be having a horrible game and you don't know that person is playing with like a messed up ankle or messed up knee. You don't know if they've been arguing with the with the with the trainer. Coach. Yeah, they've been arguing arguing with the trainer, with the coaches. The coaches have been arguing with the player just so he, he can play or not. So and that's a lot of the things that you know, people don't see on Monday to Friday. They only see how you're performing on Sunday, on, on Saturday, and they judge you based on that alone. But I started realizing there's a lot of reasons why players have bad games. It's not just, they're not just shit. Like sometimes you see amazing players just having a bad game. You might not understand why. But there's so much more happening like behind the scenes, like when it comes to like health wise or dealing with like the politics of like, again, like I said, my, in, my, in my case, like I knew I was, going to start in the first team I went with but because there was a guy who was like been in the team for like ages you know of course the coach was going to give him favor over me even though I ended up not scoring too many goals that season anyways so so there's a lot of things that go behind in the medical things as well that people never understand but they just see Sunday or they see Saturday and they judge players and that so I, I gain a completely different like respect for professional athletes and you know Especially the ones that do it consistently, they like every day perform high levels. Hats yeah, yeah. Hats off to those guys because it's not easy at all. Yeah, I mean, those guys that play like 20 years in a row. Bro, oh, man, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. But again, that's the life, you know, I choose to do and I'm not, you know, not complaining about it. It's fantastic, but there is a lot that goes in to get to Sunday or to get to Saturday that a lot of people don't see. And I hope there is at some point there is some like documentary or something that could show that behind the scenes of like football of the real like grit behind that. All right, Nick, write down on our production yeah. list. Uh, we're yeah. gonna take the cameras <laughs> over there and documents. Uh, and stuff. Take cameras over there. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. We got uh, we, we got the connect already. 
we got to yeah. connect. Maybe, the, maybe not. Maybe not during Corona times. Yeah, <laughs> we, gotta, we, gotta, yeah. we gotta knock COVID out before they let us in. Yeah, not not COVID out, and then yeah, for sure. So, but yeah, I forgot what I was gonna ask you. Yeah. Yo, but that's how. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, shoot, I forgot again what I was gonna ask you. Uh, oh no, yo. So how do you end up in FIFA, bro? Oh man, yo, I was that, was, about that, that. that was that was that was awesome, man. Like I remember, I didn't even know. I like, remember, did they come like, up to you or? Bro, I didn't know. You don't tell you. you. They, just put your, they just put your team on there. and then They, they just took like, your rights and you slapped, stamped you in there. They don't tell you, man. The, you get money they're, they're, for that or, or no. FIFA owns you kind of thing. Yeah, because your league, you're like registered to your league. And if the league isn't like, if it's in FIFA, then pretty much FIFA can do whatever they want to do. With the uh, okay. which yeah, which, so don't play players and get paid for that. No. So you didn't get you didn't get any headshots. They didn't ask you to do any kind of running. Nothing, thing. nothing, zero. Because they already have your headshots with like every every player has a headshot with the team already. So they just take it from that. They don't ask you anything. So maybe I, maybe they maybe they talk to like the best, maybe like to Ronaldo or like Messi, Messi those guys, you know. But like to most other players, they don't ask you anything. You All right, no. This this has to do with FIFA, but I, I want to know. So on your teams, were you one of the fastest players? Were you a medium, 100%. average, or slower faster. player? Faster. Fastest? 100%. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so here's my question. Why that is makes me it, feel better because I could barely keep yeah. up with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> why is it, and I guess I understand why. I think it has to do with yeah. your game. But on FIFA, yeah. if I remember correctly, I could look it up, but I didn't. I, I yeah. played with your character before when you mm. first came out because I just thought it was I thought it was cool, and yeah. I think your speed, your top speed, was in the fifties, and I was like, "This is not that's crazy, man." Fact. I know, I, but they're, they're savage in you, bro. I knew you. I know. That's, that's a, BS, you just dropped that lawsuit, bro. I know. That's and, and I try yeah, to make the yeah. argument. I try to make the yeah. argument to some people that speed yeah. should not be on FIFA based on if the player is known or not. They should take the time to decide if the person's fast or not yeah to test the play like for every time in like games yo everybody every time like i'll catch up to people like i almost used to tease people at sometimes like i almost let them go by me and then just catch them like i was the fastest person on my team probably in the league people used to say charlie davis was the fastest in the league but i knew like several times i'll just like people would go by me and they'll think oh they're gone i'll just catch up to them so i was 100 percent sure i was like faster than most and people like i can imagine uh, you you're already fast when i met you and then yeah you, so you imagine you like faster. imagine yeah doing like proper training proper muscles again like you know i was so that fifa with the stuff was bs but like i didn't to me i was just happy that i was on it bro like bro yeah. i remember you used to run with the ball and i used yeah. to like kick you on the leg bro and like, you <laughs> just keep on running the tree trunk <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking like kicking a fucking three, bro. No, 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 like, no, no, no. We talked, we talked about this with Derek, actually. He was talking about the time. Oh, yeah, we did. No. People would kick you, and then you'd, you'd yell out a scream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or or Jono would hit you in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, man, that FIFA stuff is BS. But again, for me, I was just happy to be on, like, that's something that I could always have, you know, like, yo, that's, I was yeah, that's a bucket list right there. Yeah, that's bro, cool. that's crazy, that's man. Awesome. It's funny because a friend of mine called me. It's my, my former co rec coach. His son calls me. He was like, yo, this is when it happens. Like, yo, you're on FIFA, bro. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're on FIFA. So they don't even tell you. Like, you don't even know. Like, I didn't even know I was going to. So, but it was really, like, it was really cool and exciting. And, and up to this day, it's still on there. Like, it's, I'm sure it's, if you go online somewhere, you find it. But it was quite. Uh, it was really cool to be like to be on a FIFA game. Like. But yeah, it was yeah. cool, man. It was really nice. Even though yeah, my speed, flex. my speed was like BS, though. <laughs> yeah, they did you dirty on that one. Yeah, it wasn't fair for the rest of them, man. You know, they got they got to sell they got to sell so, copies. But I think so, what they do, what they do is like the status of the player increases the the profile in those stats. I think. All right, hold on, guys. Hold on, really yeah. fast. Um, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna see if it will let me do this or not. Um, is this it? Is this? Is this? Yeah, this is it. All right. So check it out. You guys got to tell me this. Actually, you got to tell me this is legit or not. Okay. Since we're talking about FIFA, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So there's yep. you. This is you on FIFA 2009. It said yeah. you were 189 centimeters, 86 uh, kilos. Uh, that's yeah. your birthday, I guess. You were 22 yeah. at the time. 
Yeah. Um, and this is your numbers. Look at your defense, your mentality. Where's the speed? Your speed was not good. I remember it. Your goalkeeping skills were bad. I don't, you need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you ask me, I think all of that was like BS, bro. Yeah, look, sprint that. speed. Your sprint speed wow. was big. That's, That's so crazy, low. Bro. That's crazy. That's crazy. Bro, they got you like like an unsuccessful law student, bro. Like, All controls you know, of 46. Man. Like, I, know, I mean, bro, I, like, I think that they just need to make a better um, a better effort at seeing yeah. people that yeah. are biggest names in football. Yeah. Maybe our kids' them. FIFA game will have that, Nick. Yeah, yeah well, I, don't, I don't know, but they could do it a little bit better than what like, they They really could. It started I'm with a grab, mugshot, man. I'm going to grab my charger real quick. Oh, no, Go you ahead. Know, was that, yeah. But yeah, man, I think most of that stuff was like, like BS. I mean, even my strength was like 73. I was stronger than everybody in the, in the league, I thought, like seriously. So, and that's like, and that's one thing I know, like naturally I was strong. So imagine like lifting weights. I used to just shove people left and right. And still they put only 73. That should be at least 80. It should have been at least 80. So, but again, at least, you know, I can't complain. I made FIFA, so FIFA 09. So <laughs> I think my friend still has still has that game actually. I signed it for him. So but that was that was pretty cool. That's what's up. Yeah. Yo, as far as yo, I gotta I gotta like off the topic question. As far as partying goes, like how much do y'all get to not party or party? And like oh, do, do you have any like crazy animals in your teams? A Ronaldinho contract. Oh yeah. Man. We oh man. I think that, that also helped. You guys go out at it all made, sometimes? Made, have, that helped make my injuries worse, bro. Oh, for real? Yeah, because, like, partying when you're injury, injured and, like, drinking is not good at all. Yeah, it's not so good recovery. It, it's not yeah, good recovery, recovery sucks. at all. But, yeah, we had, we had some phenomenal nights, actually. Like, actually, most professional players, they party a lot more than most people because you get a limited amount of time, a break, where you get, you're like, and that's the only time you can do that. So the guys are like, hey guys, this is all the time we have. Let's go out and have a fantastic time. We've had some monumental nights. So yeah, we did party a lot. Like some of the, some of the yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had fun. Yeah, we've we, 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 we yeah, yeah. We, 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 we've had quite it a lot. It definitely happens. Yep, yeah, we've had a, a lot. That's, yeah. that's possible. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you guys, since we're on the topic, did you guys have anybody like, um, like a Cristiano Ronaldo, where he basically, uh, he doesn't do any of that kind of stuff in season because he watches after mm. his body so much. Did you guys have any players like that that were concerned no. about that side of the game, or they were just not really? Actually, about no. That? Actually, we had players who were like concerned, but like we always had team nights, you know. So like, on team, I mean, we had guys who don't drink, but they still go out with us. When right. we had team nights. Yeah, and usually, like, team nights is quite, like, everybody goes out and have fun. Even if, even for the guys who are, like, you know, strict with everything with their bodies, they still go out with the team because it's like a team thing, you know. It's like a, a bonding, so everybody yeah, yeah. goes out. Yeah, we all go out and have fun. But there's guys who used to go out, like, after every game. And so there was, there was a period there where I used to go every, after every game if we had, like, two days off, right after a game for a win. Of course, I hit the town, bro. Like, hit the town, like... You get into like uh, like nightclubs, like free free entrance, VIP entrance. Oh, Everybody knows you, so that's like that's a lot of fun. So that was good after a win. But if we lost, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> we're the, we're the fans. quarantine. I'm not. I'm quarantined, bro. Yeah. Were the fans um, kind of like they are in the big leagues in the sense of if they saw a footballer out, their team just lost, and they're shopping, or maybe they're they're uh, out with some friends just enjoying having a good time i've seen a lot of like media like england spain where they would get mad yeah, spiteful. so would you would yeah. you guys have the same scenario there in sweden or in finland if you're out you guys lost would they yeah. would they have any backlash of course man we have we've had fans like try to approach us when we're out sometimes where even if we're one bro and these guys will be like fans people will be like someone will be drunk because usually we'll be in a chill area you know and they'll be like drunk fans and they'll be like either talking to one of the players like hey you're like you're crap you play like crap today like just you know but we can't we can't do anything you know because we know like it's just they're trying to set you up 
Yeah. So we just like we just ignore it or just like but there's several several times I've like held a few of my friends back who were like they just had it. <laughs> I'm like yeah. I was like yo just don't even it's not even worth it, man. So yeah, it happens. But like I was there was times where like when I was injured, I remember when I was injured, I came back. I first came back from injury. I was out. I had like I had a really bad game, like, and I rarely had a bad game the whole time. Like I've been playing, but I had a really bad game, and some fans like walked up to me and was asking me like, he was telling me like, hey, like you seem like you don't want to be on the pitch. And I was like, yo, I just came back from injuries. My first game back. I'm giving everything I want, but my body is not, you know. My body's not moving the way I want it to move. I just, it's my first game back from being out two months, you know, but I don't want to tell him that because it's a waste of my time, you know, but, but then I understand that aspect of it, but they don't understand like, you know, those little like things to where, like I said, if a player's having a bad game, you have no idea what's happening. It might be injury. It might be, you know, you don't know what's happening with the family, but fans expect you to be top level every time. Um, but it's not as bad here with the fans as in like in um, in like in the UK and like in Germany. But I remember one time when I was like this time before I came back from that injury, while I was injured, there was this a friend sent me like uh, there was this message board that fans used to write some stuff there. A friend of mine sent me a message board that fans were talking like all kinds of craziness about me, and even had some really like horrible looking offensive stuff that pictures and stuff that they've, they've drawn just because I wasn't playing, but I was injured. I can't like, I, if I'm injured, I can't do anything about it. So they were saying like, oh, I don't want to play or I came here just to take the money. I was like, yo, like football is something I've been doing when I wasn't getting paid. Mm -hmm. So why will I get to a top level and all of a sudden I'm 100% fit and not want to play? If I'm not playing it's because I'm injured, but they were thinking, oh, I don't want to play. I just came here to get the money, but yeah. I'm injured. So you get those kind of interactions with fans all the time. But then for me, I kind of just let those things like, you know, water off a dog's back in a way, because I didn't care. I know, like, I know I've been playing for free. And they, I know what I'm, you know, what I'm, what I'm about. And the teammates know what I'm about. So if fans want to act crazy, they want to, you know, but that's their problem. But I've always had like really good relationships with our fans and really horrible relationships with fans of other teams because I was, <laughs> because I was very... There's a culture of ignorance within it, even at the, especially at the highest level. Of course, man. Of course. Of course. But I love... I love do you, bro, do, yeah. do you ever experience any racism, bro? Of course, bro. Like, like what? Could you share yeah, yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, there was times where like we were playing a game and um, their fans were screaming like... Like, well, they were screaming, like making like monkey sounds, or they were saying the Are you serious? Yeah, bro. And there was a few times where the guys were like, go back to Africa. And I was like, yeah, I'm actually from Africa. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't like, that didn't affect me much. But then, yeah, man, but there was, a, there's actually been a few articles written about that. If you check online, like, about like some of the incidents that, that I went through here. Damn. But for, yeah, but for me, like, Again, that didn't affect me playing so much. I just yeah, I was gonna play. say like you don't, you don't. I don't think you're the type of guy that like will get sucked up by by things like that because you're not nah, sensitive bro. like that. Nah, but bro. older players definitely does though. You know, some players yeah, yeah. mentally are not strong enough to deal with that. Yeah, but it's hard, man. It's difficult, but you know. Yeah. For me, I had the mentality to where like, this is like ignoring guys, but it affects you, man. Because when, especially when like the league doesn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. or like they don't acknowledge that it's rampant or that it happens that's the that's the part that hurts more than the actual insults for me when people say no nah, that, that stuff doesn't happen do they you try know? to ban any fans if they caught any fans you know like in the uk like uh, they always have cameras now and they catch them and ban them well now they're starting to do it because it's popular <laughs> you know right. it's you know yeah but before there's ever been several incidents so, that nothing has been done about so i don't I don't like get into politics too much and you know, yeah. some, people, some people have a lot of opinions about that as good or bad, but mm. just, I'm, I'm doing this based on what you just said. You're saying they're doing it because they're popular. Um, I understand yeah. the, the world we live in, the climate we mm. live in. Um, do you believe, and I hope, I hope it mm. is something that is a real change, but mm. do you believe that this is going to be a real change in some places in the world or is it just being done because that's what you're supposed to do? It's, I think on the sports side, it's being done. My honest opinion, it's been done because 
is a popular thing to do now. There isn't because trust me, if if they if the teams wanted to do real real change, they would have done real change a long time ago. You know why is all why is it all of a sudden that teams are starting to wear Black Lives Matter on their shirts? This is the first time that racist abuse has, has happened. This stuff has been going on for like six, seven, eight, nine, ten years now. Yeah, you know, I, I, so, yeah. You know, so if they wanted to actually take action towards like you know, like racism in football, they can take a harsher stand towards it. I really believe they can, but for some reason, either they they think we're not. The teams are like teams are always like, no, we're not that bad. There's only one of you people. But this if it keeps happening over and over, and there isn't like a like a proper solid band ban or some some something that affects the team. Like I, I really wanted to say, if there's a team that's a repeat offender, they should take three points. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because I want to see. Yeah, no, I agree. Money, I, yeah. Yeah. audiences, ticket sales, yeah. everything, and, bro. And and that's, that's that's the only way they learn. And that's if when they find out that yes, this person is a fan of that club, and yes, this person has done this repeatedly, and the team hasn't done anything. Trust me, if you take out three points. You won't have a single racist in football anymore. <laughs> I, I know that, you know, it's, you know? It's, really, it's really hard to change people's opinions. Um, yeah. And I know that goes, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of things about this lately. It goes with education and, exactly. you know, yeah. and everything else. But, but I do like what you said as far as in sports, like whether it be football or American football or basketball yeah. or whatever, if they could punish the team directly for having fans that are going to be racist, that could yeah. – possibly stamp out some of that at least in the in the in the sports world yeah and you know if, if team if like if the if the leagues decide to do that guess what teams will make sure they'll enforce better rules for their fans because teams don't want to lose points and also fans don't want to lose points because yeah, yeah, that, that's talking uh, to the fans right you know, here. yeah so uh, so all those three main sections then will start working together because they don't want to see their team do bad you know, so that would be an incentive for teams to have stricter regulations for fans. They'll be like, if you, we hear one, we'll ban you. And because that, I think that would be a punishment for repeat offenders taking three points. So that way, teams would be like, if there's someone who does it one time, we'll ban him right away because we don't want to give him a second chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so then there's stricter rule. Then teams are like, teams and fans, they're more cautious how they react towards players. And that's the only way it changes, man, when you do something that affects the teams. And like points, like taking three points away. Because if you don't do that, it's still going to keep happening. You know? Yeah, that's man, that's all that's, on FIFA, though, man. That's all on yeah, FIFA. That's, that's, People yeah, got to make a, yeah. a stand, too, man. Like, yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm tired of... to make a like, change. Yeah, I'm tired of seeing these banners, like, no the racism. Yeah, they're yeah. worrying about the freaking cameras and shit in the, in the replays and that's the bars crazy. and, like... This, no, like that's, the that's, the, that's the most horrible thing. This no to racism banners I see during games. It annoys me. This is, it's all just like, they don't do anything. For show. Sure. It's all just for show. Sure. They don't do anything. But again, that's the, that's the, that's the game. And we're just kind of living in it. And I'm trying to play the best we can, man. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 on a lighter I, note. Yeah. On a lighter note. Bro. Are you in a relationship right now? Nah, bro. Unfortunately, how are the honeys, bro? Like, uh, as you from day back. one, what I said, how are the honeys? Oh, Scandinavian, um, yeah, of course, they were you, you, you have a lot of time to um, indulge in extracurricular activities, yeah. Know? I've been, I've been yeah. in, a, I've been in several, actually, I've been kind of, actually a serial uh, relationship guy, actually, but. In my single days, I'm um, now, for example, they have very beautiful women out here. I, I have to say, Scandinavia is the country one of the most beautiful women around. I have, I give, and for sure, and not only like pure Scandinavian women, but women, people that were, maybe they, their parents moved here from somewhere else and stuff like that. But yeah, it's a, it's a good country in that, in that regards. In those regards. Yes, yes, yes. For those, for those people who are curious. Yeah. So how do you see, man, like the status quo of, um, I already talked a little bit about it, of um, the infrastructure in the USA, man. Like, what do you think needs to change? What do you like? What do you not like? Like, for example, you're starting with like, for example, like your tryouts, even mm. as an amateur and, and later as a professional. Still a horrible yeah. process. The yeah. wasted opportunities. 
the wasted talents, man. Like so many people who are just passed by by the system. Like yeah. I would like to hear your opinion on that, and, like how you will fix it. I think one of the things that they have to get rid of is the pay for pay, play for play uh, system. That has to go because because now in, in football in the in the US, it's like if your kids can afford it, they'll play, and the kids that can't, or then they get like they get missed. And it's just that simple. The rich kids are the ones that play. Not the rich kids, but those who can afford to pay for teams are the ones that plays. As you guys know, from all the countries you guys have been to, the best mm -hmm. players come from the, the most, most humble difficult, background. difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. you know? And they, they started playing in the streets. And teams are like, oh, that guy is good. The parents can't afford it. We'll make it work. It doesn't happen like that in the U.S. You know? And until they, that's one aspect of it. There's several aspects. But until they, they kind of change that, and not also one of the things is like, if you don't go to one of the big D1 schools, or if you don't play for like the schools that play in the, in the championships or in the finals of the NCAA, like, you know, they don't look at you. Look at the MLS, like the draft. Most, most of the guys that go to the, to the MLS in the draft D1. come from the best, the D1 best schools. You know, they don't look at individual players from, so that's something which again, the scouting, and they have to change. But I think they pay for play things and then just scouting every university, man, not just the top ones in the top NCAA. Because if, some, if a player goes to all the best schools, then more than all the best schools with the best teams, they get more likely to get seen and get drafted. Even though you might have a player who's much better than, than they are, but if that player is not getting seen often, nobody's going to look at him, you know? And so, but yeah, so, and that's, uh, that's something that needs to change, for example. For example, now this is actually a guy who, um, his name is uh, Mike, Makuba Kanji. He played for Red Bulls. Uh, he played for Red Bulls a while ago. And when the Houston Dynamo, or no, when it was a team from the Colorado Rapids won the MLS Cup, he was the one that scored the, the final goal to score. And uh, he's a friend of mine. And he actually moved to the U.S. To, and went to... Uh, Milledgeville, Georgia, and attended university. And from there, he went to the Silverbacks, and then some, from the Silverbacks, he got picked up to play for Real Soccer. So, but that was a very talented player. But so if, so there's, there's stories like that, and now he plays, he plays for the best team here in Finland now, and he played a few years ago, and now he plays for the second best team. And he's played in like really good countries. He played in Greece as well in the top league. So there's, there's every once in a while that they'll pick those kind of guys from like, from those places, but they don't, they don't do that enough. And that's what they need to, they need to start. Their scouting needs to be better, like 100%. Because I know a lot of good players that I played with that never got the opportunity to like, to jump to the next level. And it's not just because, it's not because of talent. That's 100% sure it's not because of talent. It's just because they didn't get the opportunity. And I was really lucky. Like, if you see the way I, like, I end up here in, in Europe, like, that is, like, extreme luck, you know? And not too many kids get, get to be that lucky, even if they're talented. So, and like I said, the, the pay-for-play system is yeah, not good at all because the kids from the poor neighborhoods who just play, on, play street ball, they never get the opportunity. So, hopefully it changes, but fingers crossed. Because America has a country of over what? 300 million people you can't tell me we don't have the best we can produce a team that, that can yeah, challenge yeah. for the world cup it's not it can be possible i've played rec rec soccer rec league i've seen the talent out there the talent is there so it's not like we don't have the talent the talent is there it's just like it's just not working out like you know the selection process and, and things of that nature and the coaching the as well. and the coaching as well needs to change i think what yes. man had in mind was a really good good idea, but they didn't let him like do it the whole way. And and it's it's not only it's like from the bottom up, man. The whole thing needs to change. And that's why I don't think it's not going to change anytime soon. But fingers crossed. Let's hope hope it changes. But because and once America gets to a level to where they change the system, no no country is going to compete. It's no, it's yeah, not going to be. It's because, the only sport we haven't dominated in the Olympics. Yeah, because we have every single country in America, <laughs> literally. Literally. <laughs> like, like, we have every, so if we can pick from the best of those, come on, man. Um, like, I mean, it might take, like, yeah, it might take two generations, but let's hope. 
they put What's the main the difference to you between an MLS team and a European team? I think it's more technical and mental side of the game. Like in the MLS, it's a lot more strength and like and pace. And overseas is a lot more technical and understanding of the game is a lot more. But yeah, because when I watch an MLS game, it's like, it's faster when you watch it. But if you watch the, if, you, if you're just watching both, right? If you're watching the MLS and you're watching the European League, you would think the MLS League, the MLS is faster. It's not. Because when I'm, when I'm, when I'm playing, like, it's just the players here, they think, two, three steps ahead of the move. While in the MLS, they're just more, they're more reactive. So everything looks faster. Players think faster here in, in Europe. And that's kind of like the only difference. And they, they, they get coached from the beginning in the academies to play that way, you know? So, but like I said, the US has the tools and, you know, to be that powerhouse in football. And hopefully, you know, it gets that way. But again, baby steps. But yeah, but I think, the, like I said, the only difference is like here is more technical and the pace of the game mentally, like thinking uh, like three, four heads, uh, four moves ahead of time. Uh, that's uh, the only difference. Because when I came here, the only thing I had to catch up with was the speed of the game and thinking fast. That was it. Because um, I could dribble pass guys i could defend the guys i could pass the ball but it's just that when i was passing the ball they, anti they knew where the ball was going to go to before i passed the ball so i had to start thinking like they were thinking you know and that was the only difference uh, like and that was why it, it took me like three months to kind of catch up to that pace here three four months to catch up to that pace here and that's the only difference i see when i watch the mls and like you know and watch the the leagues here and like when you watch a European football game, you, you think it's slow as hell, right? <laughs> like, it looks like they're small, slow, they're taking the time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, especially like, for example, like the Spanish league or the Italian league. For example. Right. Or even, yeah. or even City, Manchester, or even the, be the best teams in like England. I mean, they're, when they get to like the attacking phase, it's of course, it's like, it's like fast pace. It's like lightning. But yeah. yeah, it's like, let's go. But before they get there, it's actually quite slow in the way they play, but fast in the thinking. You know, so they let the ball do a lot of the work, but in the US, they let the people do a lot of the work. So there's those little like different, you know, like nuanced differences, but, but yeah, um, I think that, like I said, the US has, um, they have the tools to change that. I hope they have the, the mindset to be like, okay, let's let go of what we've been doing before and change your mindset to what has worked in Europe. Like Germany did that for a while. You know, Belgium did that. They went for, they just decided to change a whole program. And the guys that won the World Cup, the, yeah, the guys that won the World Cup, that German World Cup with the Ozil and all of that. That, was a, that was a generation where they decided we were going to do things differently. We we're going to change the whole structure, break everything down and start anew. And that worked fantastically. Belgium did the same thing. So a lot of countries, I've gone through that process of like, okay, it's not working. We'll break everything down and start over. So I hope the U.S. can kind of like, you know, do that as well at some point. I'm assuming you watched the last World Cup. Yeah, man. Yep, I yep. feel like, like um, this, this conversation applies to so many things in that, in this last World Cup that we had. I think yeah. it was very even out, man. Like I feel, I've never seen like such an even that World Cup, like. In, in yeah, those man. group stages, it felt like yeah. anybody could have, like, made it to the, to the last, like, finals. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, because every team, like, countries, players are getting the best coaching. So they're getting the best coaching from, from like, the best, like, because now there's this uh, coaching method called the Econo coaching, coaching method from uh, Barcelona. And, like, teams have access to that in every country. And team, have, they've made it a priority to teach a certain style of play from every single academy throughout the whole country, you know. And so you can see that now. And that's why you get, there's a lot more international players in the big leagues in the world. It's not just a coincidence. It's the countries actually make the conscious decision. Let's start training our players 
to play in England, to play in, in Germany, to play in Spain. They start doing that from a very young age, you know, but in the US they don't train kids to play in like the big European leagues. And that's why we struggle in the World, world Cups. Yeah, and in some third world countries too, unless you have maybe some money. Yeah, like again, like third world countries, man, like they have good coachings. If you look at the smaller, like uh, Iceland, for example, like it's a small country, country of like over, what, 200,000 people? Look at that team, man. And what did they decide to do as well? Break down the whole coaching system, start a new, and those are the players that they started with. And it took like 10 years. I think the best then, example for a small country yeah. that kicks ass is Uruguay, man. Uruguay is like... Oh, yeah, yeah, three million people. Yeah. Bro, man, there's so many uh, small countries. Like, look at all the African countries. Like, there's so many, like, it's just, it's just because they've decided to invest in proper coaching and proper ways of playing football. And that's, gotcha. uh, and that's about, and the people are more passionate about playing football. And they pick the best players. More times than none in those countries, the best players are going to end up in the best leagues. And the best governments do, or maybe the worst, because I feel like somebody said that it's not me. I forgot who he was. That a country's government, or no, a country's economic status reflects a lot on its uh, of how well it's doing. Yeah. For example, also uh, in this past World Cup, you know, Russia was playing like extremely well. And then a few yeah. months after, we found out that they were they were doping. Have you been yeah. <laughs> through any, have you witnessed any, any doping? Like, do you guys get, ever get surprised? No, actually, we haven't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember having any, like, seeing anybody doping here in Finland or in Sweden. Not like, really. Who, who does the testing yeah. when it comes to clubs? Is it the league that does it? Yeah, the league does it, and it's random. So, like, it's, it's right, random a, testing, right? right after a game, they just come and pick a player. They've, they've picked me so many times, bro. <laughs> oh, for real? <laughs> yeah, they've picked me so many times. You know, I know it. Yeah, there were times where I couldn't pee, and like it's funny. I, I knew some of the guys who were actually doing the testing. I actually became friends with them, <laughs> so it was fun. <laughs> so like every time, I'm like, hey guys, how are you doing? And sometimes when I couldn't pee. I just like after a game, I'll drink a beer because we get you to, to pee faster. So I've been like, you know. I'm like hey, I say, hey guys, do you, do you guys want a beer? It was funny though because I got picked several times, but for me it was. It was like kind of fun, just you know, joking around with the guys who were doing the testing. I kind of, yeah, but yeah, it's it happened. I I think doping isn't like that rampant here, and but I think in the bigger leagues, it's not doping. It's like uh, team sponsored health health management. <laughs> team sponsored health. <laughs> That's yeah, <laughs> but yeah, bro. Like especially in Germany, like it's not all the, the bigger leagues because those the amount of games they play is come on. Yeah, the amount of games, the amount of, the amount of games they Your play. Your body season, just bro. cannot take that like that, man. It's man, impossible, like bro. It's, it's so impossible. hard, man. They have like, like supplements, sh- like special supplements yeah. that are not illegal. They're not illegal, yeah. but they're not legal. But you know, I'm telling you, to anybody like, watching yeah. this, man, like yo, you know, recently uh, I got back from vacation. I had a, a leg injury, so I gained a little bit of weight. So I was like, man, I'm just gonna have to go ham. So I started yeah. running and training like twice a day, bro. Yeah. Like oh my second weekend, like bro, like I can barely walk, bro. Like yeah. as soon as I start walking up a hill, just yeah. like leg needles poking and all that. Yeah. I mean I need to rest and all that, you know. I'm I'm not I'm not gonna compare the yeah. the you know the the extremity to like you know what you guys go through, but man, for yeah. anybody watching, it's go try it thing, out. Man. Yeah, because the body is can't recover that fast over that long period of time. It's impossible. Yeah. Nick, do you have another question or should we jump to the golden questions? On the, on the top leagues, yeah. <laughs> the golden question. The gold, what's um, the golden question? I, I had one, but I, I lost it in the midst of you guys talking about that right there. So um, I, I think it had something to do with um, the U.S. being better, but I, I, I lost it. So, so it's all good. Um, so I guess the question he, he was referring to, though, is at the end of these um, podcasts or whatever you want to call whatever we're doing right now, uh, we always ask the people if they could pick a, a starting 11 that they played with, uh, who would yeah. your starting 11 be? Yours is probably going to be more vast than most people because you obviously have professionals to choose from. I'm not yeah. assuming that anybody that wasn't professional would be in your starting 11, but you have the option yeah. of anybody. 
but you you have to have played with them. Uh, it yeah. could be, it could be like, for instance, like you can't pick like Etzo, you can't pick Roger Miller, you know, you can't. Yeah, yeah, Miller. okay. Yeah. Even though that would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. Man, that would be hard, man, because I've been in like four teams, bro, <laughs> only here in <laughs> overseas. And then like, Brown. and then like university and high school. Oof. That's going to be tough. Um, and I mean, I, yeah. if whatever you think, I mean, if you, um, forget you can always add somebody in if you don't remember yeah. you know hey whatever i mean there's been so many people you played with so i know that's probably really difficult on the spot i know i know i know john is gonna get mad at me if i don't put him on you because <laughs> he thinks he's better than he thinks he's, he's the best right back that ever stepped foot on a pitch <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta make sure he watches this yeah 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 but yeah man hey this sucks though because i'd like to put some of the guys from college but i played if I played four years, I played for like eight years professionally, so it's yeah, kind of no, hard. Don't, don't put any, you know? don't feel like you have to put anybody okay. in. Like, it's all totally up um, to Let me see. When I think about, I miss that goalkeeper. Um, is this, is this, let me see, Sweden? Oh, this is actually a guy I played with in Rovaniemi. He's actually a Cameroon guy. I actually brought him to um, my first team in Finland. And uh, his name is Alex, Alex Nyom. And he was like, he was a cat, bro. He was, I never seen anybody like on the go like him my whole life. His reflexes were just unreal. And he's like bigger than me. Damn. And bro, guy. no, he's like not only tall, he's like really like big, bro. Like he's muscular. Big, muscular, he's like. Like a football like, player. Yeah, man. But the way he could move was just unreal. And when he comes out for the ball, nobody, everybody just like, nah. Corners, <laughs> no, thank nobody, you. nobody even goes because he comes up like, if you hit him, you just like, you pass out. And like, even when they give like side crosses in, he would dive from the goal, like diving towards the penalty box. So he would always dive that direction when any cross was coming, either low, high. Usually, you know, sometimes most goalkeepers would like either stay on the goal and like wait, he would, Man, but he was deadly, bro. He was even when I sometimes we would do shooting shooting practice. Man, I was like, yeah, Alex. You know. And he played actually played for the Cameroon national team, the youth levels. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, damn, it sucks that I have to pick only one. But you can keep yourself on defense and just add around you too. He can put himself strong if he wants to. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Um, bro, okay, you can so coach the team if I you start, want to, bro. I start from the, yeah, maybe I maybe I I coach, but let me see. From the left side, left back. I have a friend of mine who's uh, actually plays for Sampdoria now. I played with him in the team where we went to Europa League. His name is uh, Omar Omar Koli. He actually plays for Sampdoria now as a um, center back, and he was just a beast, bro. He was. One of those guys where he can run like touchline to touchline for 90 minutes nonstop. And wow. defending, defending, nobody was going past him. And then he was very good as well, technically. And he plays for the Gambian national team now as well. And uh, so center back, there was a guy named, uh, a friend of mine, I played with him as well, his name is Marcus. He's playing the same team that I played uh, in the Europa League. And uh, he has, he's one of the best passes of the ball. I've ever seen, but he was the most like nonchalant guy you could imagine. And he was just smart as hell. He wasn't fast, but he was really fast when he had to be. And he could read the game very well. And he could play every single ball in the book, like diagonal, single pass. And he would, it doesn't matter if he has a defender, uh, attacker behind him, he could get the ball from the, from the goalkeeper and still make that fantastic, like short five meter pass, 10 meter pass, like 20 meter pass, he could make every single pass in the book with his left foot. So he'll probably be as like a left central defender. So I'll probably put myself, I guess, center back next to him. And then right back, hmm, who would it have to be? There are a lot of good right backs. And that's, hmm, I'm trying to think. Raul Bonrostro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think right back. So who do I put? 
Oh, yeah, when I was in Sweden, I played with this right back. His name was Edwin Perry. He's actually from Zambia. And he was, again, he was just, nobody goes past him, bro. He was just a monster. And because he was quite short as well, but he could win headers fast, technical, good on the ball, and just the nicest guy as well, on and off the pitch. But he was like physical, like hell. He would talk to you and smile. <laughs> and, yeah. And he was one of the guys who could cross the ball. He was very good, good crosser of the ball as well. So that would be my back four. And then midfielder. Actually, one of my friends, he played for a New Zealand national team. And when New Zealand played the Mexico in that qualification game, he was the one who took the penalties. And he played for Fulham, for Fulham uh, on the 21s, on the 17s. And uh, I played with him here as well. Chris, Chris James, his name is. And he's a very good, like, technical player. He's, uh, he's not fast, but very intelligent and can just, like, one-touch pass and finds the right pass every time, one-twos. He's a very good player as well. So I'll play with three in the middle. So I'll go with like four, maybe four, three. And the, the other two on, in the midfield, there's this guy called, uh, his name is Daudaba. He's a Gambian, Gambian, Gambian guy. And he played for the Gambian national team. He played for Augsburg in, um, in Germany as well. And he also played for one of the best teams in Finland as well. And he's, you can't get the ball off him. Like, it's impossible. It doesn't matter what you do. Like, if you kick, he just is, and it's a glider. Like, you don't think he's fast, but he's, like, technically, he's just technically sound. His finishing from, like, outside of the box is just unreal. He, would, he could pick whatever area he wants to put the ball in, and, like, it's going in. Like, goalkeeper has no chance. And then uh, the other third midfielder to complete that trio will be, hmm, let me see. There's two guys that I'm battling. I get, I can't. I can't. One of them is a Nigerian guy who played Niger, Nigerian national team, and the other one is uh, from Ivory Coast. Damn, this is hard, man. Um, yeah, I'll try and go. This guy, Paul, Paul Obefile, his name is. He played in like Nigerian national team as well, and he used to like just chip the ball over people in the midfield like it's nothing bro like it was so funny to watch sometimes i almost start laughing while doing a game <laughs> because i'm passing a ball and he wouldn't even be looking and the player will be coming full speed and the balls on the ground would just like chip and the guy would just boom, he would just chip he used to chip people all the time like the game. <laughs> so that was and technically he was a very good player as well and he can like make every pass and his understanding of the game it's unreal. So those are the three guys I'll pick. So, and then attacking wise, let me see. Oh, that's that's a tough one. It's hard, man. Damn, this is hard. So I'll probably play a four-three-three. So the top three striker. Which striker have I played with? That's what I'm trying to think. Hmm. Oh, it's hard, bro. Hmm. I played with one striker who played in the Indian. Uh, he played in the Indian league before as a Nigerian guy as well. He's a little bit. I'm a little bit taller than him. He's just as fast as me, just as physical, and has a real good finishing touch. His name is Dudu. He's a very, very good player. So he would be like the center. Like, like central uh, striker. And then on the left side, oh, it's hard. Left side, left side. I don't know. Too many, like, a lot of good guys. On the left side, who would I pick? Actually, there's a guy I played with in the second league after I came back from my injury. His name is Sake. He's a good, uh, he's a good left back, but as a left and as a left, like on the on the top three, he's, he has he crosses the ball like like no one I've ever seen, and he's fast and physical, and his aggression for the game is is like unrivaled, and he can like his free kicks is sick as well, 
So out there, and he, he when I played striker actually, and one in like five preseason games, every time I'm running to the box, he'll just be like, he'll look up, he can cross the ball from anywhere, and he can find your head or your feet, like every single time. Like I'd say eight out of ten times, he'll find find the player. So probably Saki on the on the left side. On the right side, um, hmm, let me see. Think. Oof. Who was in the right right wing when I played in the course? Mm. Yeah, sorry, it's hard, man. I'm trying to think right side, right side. Right side, right side. Um actually he's this young kid actually. He's actually 18. I play with him in the second division as well, but he plays for the under 21 national team. And I played with him for some cup games as a striker. And he has a very good shot on him. His understanding of the game, he's like, he's like, he plays like an old man, like literally, like mentally, like yeah. he plays, yeah. And so I really enjoyed playing with him because a lot of the one twos I did with him, we never, it's not something we ever like talked about or I, ne I never played with him in, in training, but whenever I played with him in games, he's like, there was this thing where we un both understood each other. Yeah, a lot and of I chemistry. Think, yeah, and I think it takes like a really high, high, high uh, IQ player, and especially one in that age to kind of just understand like different movements and where to like passing and shooting, just yeah. a lot of things that he understood like. The so basic technical stuff. Yeah, at such a young age, like movements that he shouldn't have been able to um, to be you know to be doing, and without even practicing it that much. His last name is Axeli, so probably him. And uh, yeah, that that uh, complete out my top my top uh, three. Uh, and who will be coaching this team? Who will be coaching this team? Actually, I would want to take two coaches because one of the best coaches I've ever had was uh, a Spanish coach on the technic technical side. And I learned, learned more with him than I learned with any other coach. And that was like, that was the last coach I played under. Technically, he's one of the best coaches I've ever seen. Like coach, like practice, training, everything was fantastic, technical wise. And um, he'll be like probably the second coach. But my first coach will be the guy I played with in the team eighth he's called uh yalo he used to play for the finnish national team and he's just like his personality is like he has that kind of sir alex ferguson personality where you're like yeah yeah that's that's a coach you know just his aura and his man management style is something i've never seen and the way he talks to players and the way players respond to him and he doesn't like he's not a guy he doesn't scream at all you you never he never screams you never hear him scream. And he will raise his voice every once in a while. And he never like, he's, when he co talk, like he coaches more than he like, he trains players in a way, and really knows how to get the best of every single player. So he will be the head coach. And then the other guy, uh, Gabi, will be the, the Spanish guy who will be the assistant. And then Yalo, who will be the, will be like my head coach, to coach the team. I think they'll merge, merge like, uh, they work really well together. But yeah, so that would be uh, my team. I'm even thinking about taking myself out, man, because it's one other central defender <laughs> I just thought of. But yeah, but that would be that would be my team. Sorry for the guys in the university, guys. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> you know, I wish, you know, but you know, the guys I've played here, like. Yo, we got one guys, more question for you. What's yeah. the best thing about playing pro ball, bro? Hmm. That's, I've never actually thought about that. That's a very good question. What's the best thing? I'd say there's a lot of good things, but I don't know. I can't pinpoint something. The best perk. The best perk or part of it. I don't know. Like, I, of course, I, I'd say like being recognized and stuff and not having fans, maybe that's, but I don't know if that's a really good thing or yeah. like, for me, that wasn't, but that's, I guess that's the only thing that someone in a, in a normal job won't have. Right. So maybe that's, but for me personally, I think the best,
part outside of that would be like the fun part I had with the guys on the team. Yeah, that's that's the, the that's, that's the most like yo like the moments we have the like the stuff we did outside of football. That was and then you know the the things you do after you win a game. So like the the stuff outside of football I did with my teammates. I think that's that's one of the, the best, best memories. The best memories and stuff like that. But just but like I thought you yeah. were gonna say I thought you were gonna say your your favorite thing was was the food. But Oh, uh, I know where you're going with that. That's something. That's <laughs> you remember, Nick? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I actually almost brought that up at the beginning of the interview when he's talking about being yeah. in Sweden. Because he's yeah. he talking about right at you. He's talking about that. Like, if you YouTube you on there, one of the first thing that pops up is there's an interview when you first went to Sweden, and then you talk about how the food was good there. So that's what he's no, doing. Like, yeah, this guy asked you, like, what, what do you like about Sweden? And you're like, oh, the food is good. <laughs> well, of course, I had, to say the, I had to say the food was good. There was nothing I, else. I, I, that might have been like your first interview or one of your first interviews. So. Yeah, I had to say that. Well, the food was good for the training, for what I was doing. The pastas, <laughs> pasta. The pastas and stuff, you know, because when I was in the U.S., I was eating whatever. I was just yeah, eating whatever, you know. But the, McDonald's. Yeah, at the time, the food was good for the training. But outside of that, And I really like like the salmon that they had, the salmon and potatoes. That's one of my favorite foods now. But mm -hmm. outside of that and the pastas, like now I'm looking back and I was like, yo, that's, yeah, that was garbage. But even though it was good for the training, but outside of that, it wasn't like, you know, that, uh, that special at all. So I always make my own food now anyways. But yeah, I, I think the fun times I had with the guys will be probably the best thing. Like the moments we had and, and some of my really closest friends now, the guys that I play with. Like, for example, the guy I said, Chris, the Chris James, the New Zealand guy who played for, um, like, Fulham on the youth levels and the New Zealand national team, he's one of my closest friends now. We played on three teams together. Oh, wow. And, yeah, yeah. And the guy, and the guys, and those are friendships that he's, like, one of my closest friends. His friendships that I, you know, I got from that. And then the guy from Sampdoria who plays, like, every, after every game. Like, I talk, I talk to him every once in a while. And it's, it's so funny, like, I'm seeing him playing against like Cristiano Ronaldo and, and stuff like that. So, and those friendships that you make, you know, while you're playing and then on the nights out, you know, those moments are like, are really like really special. And that's the part, part that I miss. I actually, I don't miss anything else about playing football, but that part, like, I don't miss the playing. I don't miss like, you know, celebrations after go. I don't miss any of that because of the injuries and all the, like how, like, the pain my body went through right, the, the friendships the, those those important parts man like that's the that was the part where i was like yeah i i had so much fun with those guys and just through football and that was like bonding moments that changed a lot of things for like games and stuff like that so that bro so yeah, that. Yeah. how are you doing like right now with the quarantine stuff like and the virus over there like how are you handling it Oh, we're good, man. People are out in the streets in Finland. Everybody's fine. <laughs> because Not in the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they have a very good healthcare system here. Mm -hmm. and so, like, when immediately the, the health crisis hit, I think the government officials, like, went through the proper steps and took uh, the precautions necessary to quarantine, self-isolation, close certain places like establishments, restaurants, offices, and for about two months. And then they started like, you know, letting people out gradually. But then they have uh, trace testing, which everybody can get a test in, in Finland, which in the US is not, from what I heard, not everybody can get a test. So everybody gets tested and everybody can be traced and tracked and get isolated. So we had a few like uh, COVID, uh, uh, some people um, uh, got COVID-19, but it wasn't as bad. Any players now. that you know got sick? No, not a single player that I know of. Okay, thank God. So yeah, not a single, single player that I know of. So my, Yo, friend, so my friend in Italy, actually, they were quarantined for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah. Damn, where are you coming to Atlanta, bro? Probably next year, man. Not, not this year, that's for sure. So hit I me hope up. I yeah. Hit me up, hit me up. No, uh, no, for no, sure, no, no. man. When I want some tickets to a to a European match, I'm gonna go with you though. Oh, dude, man! Once the because they have this uh, the next European Championship was gonna be in Scandinavia. They were gonna have some in Denmark, in Russia, uh, which is quite close. It's like 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, teach, I teach world culture, so uh, we have to yeah. do, uh, we have to do maps and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Right so, there. yeah, yeah. So yeah, the European Championship was going to be in this area. So, and some of our friends got tickets actually to go to Russia, and their games. And Finland qualified for the first time ever, so it's going to be like crazy being here. Yeah, and going to so yeah for for sure like yeah. even the European Championships or the World Cup or just you know let me yeah. know, man. You guys, we will. Uh, Anything yeah. else you want to add, Nick? No, that's it, man. It's been awesome talking to you and hearing about your journey from Cameroon, high school, college, uh, the professional game. So a lot of knowledge. Yeah, man. It's been a, such an educational podcast, bro. Probably my favorite one so far. Yeah, so, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun, man. And even though, even for, anybody, long- for anybody who wants to know your journey or like, I'm, so, I'm sure people ask you all the time, like, how do they become pro? You can just show them this video now. Like, yeah. be like, yo, you got questions? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm I got always the master class. Yeah, plus I'm always open for any questions, man, because that's one of the things that I'm trying to do now, because actually, like, just, I was like, one of the things I'm trying to do, and especially with younger players, I have my own, uh, like, consultancy now. Mm-hmm. I started, like, eight months ago. That works with, like, sports, business, and arts. And one of the things I'm trying to do on the sports side is uh, help uh, professional players like on the health management, financial management. Yes, those, if you want to send a shout out to your business, it's the right yeah. time and place, bro. Yeah, yeah, because again, a lot of players don't get taught all of these things. Yeah, that's definitely true. They don't get no. taught like, the proper Be- ways to like manage like their health, oh, no. their finances. Yeah. And Everyone's all that stuff. freestyling their way in. Nobody told me anything. Like I did all the mistakes financially that I could make health-wise with the injuries. Uh, recuperation nobody told me a lot of stuff you know and a lot of players don't go through I mean, especially the psychological and mental part of the game because when players move to a new country it's yeah. so difficult man yeah like new food new culture and you have to perform every single day and you're perform you're 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 um you're competing with four guys who after training they go home to their parents for dinner mm-hmm they have all their friends there. And when you're done, you go home by yourself, you know? And so there's a lot of these things that nobody prepares the young players coming overseas. Nobody tells them how it's going to be. And, they ex- and when you come here as an international player, they expect you to be better than the guys who are here. So you're setting up like a management company? No, no, it's a consultancy. It's more, and it's, consultancy. yeah, yeah, it's a sports consultancy. Well, it's not a sports, it's like a consultancy in general. But gotcha. sports, sports is one aspect. It's like one section of it. And then the business side of it as well. And then you have uh, art outside of it as well. So, yeah, but the sports side, which is something in my background I want to really focus on because I think it's important, man, for especially the young guys. Nobody, tells, nobody told me all the stuff I did wrong. Nobody told me, like, you know, when you have an agent, get a lawyer as well to make sure, make sure your lawyer is not, like, not trying to cheat you out of your yeah, money. Is just you. Nobody told me that. Wow. You know, and nobody tells a lot of players. I'm not trying to say if you have a if you have a if you have an agent, make sure you have a lawyer as well to check on your agent. Man, we could go yeah. we could go another three hours with you, man. I know, man. I know. <laughs> and to make sure with players while they're playing football, to make sure that you know they also prepare themselves for life after football while they're playing football. So there's oh, yeah, a lot of those things. Yeah, bro, stay blessed. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you guys, man. Yeah, thank you. Really like nice to thank our sponsors, guys. Puma, Umbro, <laughs> Adidas, Nike, Under Armour. They're going to sue you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna sue. You guys should edit it, cut that out <laughs> before they sue you guys. So. Hey, guys, <laughs> they're going to sue Pedro. Well, yeah. What are they going to take from me, bro? Exactly. My mustache? I, actually, it's, maybe it's good promo if like, it comes out in an article that Nike or Adidas try to sue you. They'll be like, oh, those guys, those guys might be doing something right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But really, really nice you know, talking. Hey, shout out to the, to the boat shoes, too, to the boat shoe company that helped yo, my brother yo, shout out. out to, shout out to the boat shoes, man, for, for <laughs> real. I saved, my, I saved my, my left big toe. <laughs> All right, you, bro. Stay, yeah. stay fresh, bro. We'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. It was nice talking to you guys. I Appreciate won. It.